Good morning and welcome. Today we're going to talk about inflammation to start this Memorial Day holiday, which as a veteran, I've always wondered about Memorial Day because it's sort of a sad occasion, but everybody celebrates it so much. Um, just remember soldiers, if you will, at some point this weekend who have died to protect our freedoms and then go on and of course celebrate with your family and friends because that's why soldiers do what they do. Um, today we're going to talk about inflammation, one of my favorite topics um, and something I've sort of had to learn about, <clears throat> I guess, over the past, I don't know, five to eight to ten years. Uh, certainly nothing I was ever really taught about um, adequately in medical school and definitely not in residency. Uh, so I'll kind of introduce the topic to you, kind of explain what it is and why it's relevant to you and how you feel on a daily basis. Um, oh, we're testing the audio. Who do you, what do you want me to do? Can you hear me? Okay. They just, sorry. They just walked out with a phone to make sure you guys could hear me. Okay. Let's get started then. I think all our technical, we're not in our normal spot as you can tell. So I had to check the tech. All right. So I'm Dr. Meredith Warner of Warner Orthopedics and Wellness, and my practice is primarily in Baton Rouge. I also teach orthopedic surgery for LSU in New Orleans, um, and I'm the founder of Well Theory and the Healing Soul. Uh, okay, so this is essentially my concept or my philosophy, and these are some of the services we offer in my clinic. Uh, I'm a huge believer in the body's ability to heal itself if given the right circumstances um, for really almost anything. Now, Granted, if you're in a massive car accident and your femur bone cracks in half, you need to have surgery and fix that. But there's a lot of things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis that really you can empower yourself to treat. And you don't need people like me holding scalpels, taking care of problems. That's my whole gestalt, although I do operate. I operate every week. Um, but I think a lot of things can be treated non-operatively, and that's where we try to push people, and naturally, ideally. All right. So... This is our clinic. So every single light in there is daylight spectrum because that's been shown to be very, very healthy for people. We have a lot of natural light. We have aromatherapy. We do everything we can to sort of um, stimulate the body's natural ability to heal and empower itself. And there's a ton of science behind everything we do. Uh, and so today I'm gonna talk about one of the fundamental foundational problems in America, in the world, uh, and with human beings in terms of our health and that would be inflammation. We've talked about oxidative stress before, happy to talk about it again, or you can go watch that talk, um, which is on the website. But today's inflammation, so let's get started. So a general overview, probably everybody sort of has a concept of what inflammation is, but today we're gonna talk about actually what it is, how it was discovered, its relevant history, just a very brief overview in medicine. Um, acute versus chronic inflammation, because that is the differential and chronic is the problem. How does diet, how does your everyday life contribute to your levels of chronic inflammation, okay? What food should you eat? What should you avoid, et cetera, et cetera. And then to make it more relevant to your day-to-day, -day, uh, how you feel is how does chronic inflammation impact your joints and how you feel in like musculoskeletal pain? And then how does it affect aging? And how will you age well in the face of all this inflammation? And then finally, maybe some tools or treatment options that you could consider. So there are two basic types of inflammation. Of course, it's very simplified, acute and chronic, okay? Acute inflammation is actually what you want. It's a good thing. It's a defensive system. It protects you. It's the type you're familiar with. It's when you get a cut. It's when you, uh, God forbid, get shot. It's when you have a car accident. It's when you get infected with a virus or a bacteria or a parasite. Your body has the ability to defend itself, and you need that. The problem is chronic inflammation. This is when acute inflammation never gets turned off or worse. You have low level, like sort of underground attacks constantly hap happening, almost like if you were a big software company and you kept getting low level hacks, right? You, and you don't even know they're happening. Eventually your system will fail as opposed to one big attack that you can manage and defend against. So chronic inflammation is the problem in modern society. That is what's causing almost all of our diseases, okay? And costing our country and your family countless amounts of money just because of chronic inflammation. So hopefully I can help you sort of fight it yourself today. Um, so we, sorry, we now know 
Okay, and this is all relatively, I want to say new. It's not new to a lot of people out there, so I don't, I don't want to offend anybody, but in terms of like basic medical care of the human being in this country, we're just now accepting and realizing that chronic low-grade inflammation is really the source of almost all the issues such as cancer, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid, autoimmune, MS, you name it, all comes down to inflammation and oxidative stress by and large. Now there's some genetic issues, of course, but let's just um, stick with the big picture. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what about inflammation? How do we even know about it? So it comes from the Latin word of inflammare, to set on fire. Okay. Hippocrates, and you may know who Hippoc uh, Hippocrates is, you may not. That is the one that um, we do the Hippocratic Oath when we graduate from medical school. And one of the primary uh, drivers or one of the main phrases is first do no harm. And that's sort of been a guiding principle for me, which is why I started to question what we're doing in Western medicine and conventional medicine, because I felt like we were actually doing a lot of harm to people uh, by not empowering themselves to heal themselves and empowering their human body to do what it was built to do, which is to heal. So Hippocrates actually described inflammation, and this was the fifth century before Christ or BC. And he also named the terms such as edema and sepsis, terms we still use today. So nothing new under the sun, right? So since Hippocrates has been around, we've known about inflammation, edema, which is swelling, sepsis, which is whole body infection. So Aulus, I can't say this name because I don't speak Latin, Aulus Celsus, he was a Roman about 2000 years ago, okay? <clears throat> he, he named the four cardinal signs of inflammation. So the term that he used was rubor et tumor cum calor et dolor. So basically redness or erythema, swelling, heat, and pain. Those are your four cardinal signs of inflammation. If you go and ask your physician, what is inflammation? I bet you that's what they'll say. Oh, it's when you have redness, swelling, uh, it hurts, and it's warm. But that'll be probably the extent of the discussion. Galen, who was a physician of Marcus Aurelius, who was one of the Roman emperors, thought inflammation allowed blood to escape the arteries. And that had been the prevailing thought until scientific tools came about. So remember, before we had tools, uh, all we had was observation, following people, talking to them, and then maybe some anatomic dissections. It wasn't until we developed microscopes, things like that, and we'll talk about that now. And every day, more and more tools are being found, so we keep learning. So I, I try to stay on top of it for all of you guys. So the microscope was invented, and then that improved what we knew about microcirculation. We were actually able to then look at capillaries. And then we could discover things like blood clots and uh, new formation of blood cells or angiogenesis. And in 1893, think about that, how long ago that was, Menchnikov described the different types of white blood cells, okay? Before that, we didn't even know there was more than one, if there was even one that we knew about. And he actually won the Nobel Prize for his work in the immune system. In the 19th century, Virchow, or Virchow, people say it differently, linked inflammation to atherosclerosis. Now think about that. Back in the 19th century, this guy Virchow linked inflammation to atherosclerosis, which is a placking in the arteries, which we now know inflammation is linked to atherosclerosis, as though it's some sort of new great discovery. The electron microscope after the regular microscope allowed us to understand even more because then we could see the cells, right? We couldn't, so we went from being able to see the capillaries and some placking to actually seeing what comprised the capillaries and the uh, placking. And then you go into things like, I mean, there's so many different things, functional MRI, different immune uh, studies, genetics, et cetera. And that's just an artery of a plaque there on the right side. So that's what globs up in your arteries and blocks blood flow. But the real problem is when the clot becomes unstable, oxidize, and then explodes, and little pieces of the explosion go to places they shouldn't go. That's what you don't want. Okay, so again, we know that inflammation is heat or like an attack of heat. Not sure it's the greatest term in the world. Maybe we need to change it, probably never be changed. Um, so you just have to understand there's acute and chronic inflammation. Now, I will say that due to the advances in technology, okay, so more and more instrumentation, better imaging, better ability to look at the cellular level, better ability to understand RNA, DNA, et cetera, and the protein structures, uh, we've learned about chronic low-grade inflammation, okay? But a lot of this was a push by the wellness industry. And you've probably been hearing more and more about uh, stem cells, longevity, anti-aging, all of this stuff coming out because of the wellness industry, sort of forcing it down the throats of medical science that maybe we need to expect, you know, look into this and help people become actually healthy 
and not just treat diseases. That's been my push and hopefully more and more physicians and more and more hospital systems, probably not insurance companies, I doubt they'll do it or the government really, but maybe we can all just empower ourselves to maybe not even need to go see people like me. What if you were really just healthy all the time? Wouldn't that be amazing? So the classic injury response or inflammation, acute inflammation was described by Dr. Ledbetter in 1989. So it sounds like so long ago, but I think Madonna still had some number one albums in. This was when you had activation of platelets and endothelium. This is when you have recruitment and activation of leukocytes. These are your white blood cells. Remember, there's various types. That was discovered way before Ledbetter. And then you have proliferation and repair of the endothelium or the lining of vessels and whatnot. You have fibroblasts that come in and lay down a new matrix for cells to build upon. And then eventually you have remodeling. So these are the phases of healing acute inflammation, remodeling, proliferation. So again, back to technology. So now we have gene knockout mice. So they have lab rats and lab mice that they actually breed or do things to to take out certain genes to be able to understand how that gene affects the health. Now the problem with mice studies um, is actually that a lot of these mice that are used in the lab come from a single line of a bizarre type of a mouse that have been inbred uh, over time. So they're, they're not really even real mice and then we use them to understand humans. So that doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's how medical science works right now. So I guess it's what we're stuck with. Um, it's really hard to find really good human studies in general. Most lab work is done in these gene knockout mice that are inbred mice over hundreds of generations from a weird type of mice to begin with. So just take everything with a grain of salt um, and we'll just keep reading and learning and I'll just keep giving you the info as I learn it. So we did immunological studies in mice to understand even more about inflammation. So, you know, over time we start to think we're smarter and smarter and we know more and more, right? Meanwhile, Virchow or Virchow in the 19th century questioned if maybe inflammation is not so good if it sticks around. What he talked about chronic inflammation back then, and basically it got ignored, right? Just, oh, stop talking. You don't know what you're talking about, kind of a thing. But he was very, very much ahead of the curve, okay? Obviously, there's a lot of stuff in medicine that he discovered and is named after him. Basically, think of it this way inflammation is your response to pathogens, virus, bacteria, protozoa, et cetera, or injury car accident, uh, fire, smoke inhalation, et cetera. But the system can be hijacked against you and it can work against you if it begins to self-attack. And that's the problem. Okay, so how does it work? And we talked about this before. We did a talk on the innate and adaptive immune system. So basically a white blood cell or WBC will attack a pathogen. How does it do this? How does it even know how to do this? Well, the pathogen is sensed as a non-self creature or non-self um, fragment, okay? And this is because on your cells, you have what are called HLA or human leukocyte antigens that tell the white blood cells, hey, I'm part of the team. Think of it like a uniform in the military. So your HLA is like the team uniform or the military uniform, okay? And if you see someone in, in your same uniform, you're not supposed to shoot that guy. You're not supposed to have friendly fire, right? The problem is when the innate immune system gets messed up and all of a sudden we have all this friendly fire, you think of that as an autoimmune disorder, okay? More advanced recognition of different pathogens and different cells is when we bring in the adaptive immune system. This is your antibodies and whatnot. So over time you develop the ability, every time you get infected with a virus, your body develops an antibody that will recognize certain proteins that are on that virus. So anytime the virus comes back, the adaptive immune system's turned on and you can attack that right away without engaging the whole learning process of the immune system again, okay? So the problem is when a pathogen antigen does not match a self antigen, okay? Then the white blood cell comes in and engulfs it, just like you see here. So it's not recognized, it attaches, it gets engulfed, and then inside the white blood cells are what are called exosomes or lysosomes. And these are little pouches filled with um, substances that allow an oxidative stress burst. Now, remember before I told you oxidative stress is terrible? Well, it is terrible in general if it's too much of it in your body over a long time. But in terms of attacking a virus and a bacteria, or some sort of damaged cell that shouldn't be there, or a tumor cell, you want your white blood cells to go in and drop the bomb of oxidative stress on that badness because it'll kill it. Then they clean up all that stuff, take it out, the macrophages come in, make it all pretty, 
and excrete everything. Uh, the problem is when this stuff sticks around and then you start attacking yourself. So oxidative stress in these situations is actually really good and you really want it. So you want the ability to do it. You just don't want this to keep going on and on and on and on. So these are your different white blood cells, okay, that have been discovered over the years. And again, acute inflammation is not a bad thing. We want that. We want the ability to fight infection. We want the ability to clean up our skin after we have it cut or scraped or whatever. We want the ability to sense tumor cells or cancers and then attack them before they become big enough to become a problem, okay? Uh, so we want this. We want some level of inflammation. We just don't want chronic inflammation. So the injured site response is similar. The neutrophils or the white blood cells will come and enter the site of the injury. They have two functions. They'll protect you from pathogens, so they prevent that injured site from becoming um, infected or having a secondary infection of that. And then it'll clean up the damaged cells so that your body can come in and lay down new cells and heal. Um, but if you get a chronic wound, this means the neutrophils never really leave. Normally, they're gobbled up by macrophages. It signals to the body, hey, we're done. We've cleaned up the site. The acute inflammatory phase is shut down, and you enter into that remodeling and proliferative phase. But if you don't, then you're just constantly in this phase where you're dropping oxidative bombs and nothing's getting cleaned up. And then all these damage signals come out. And now we're going to talk about that. That's a conversion from acute to chronic inflammation. So this kind of shows you, this is a good uh, picture. The left side is normal skin um, at the microscopic level. And then the one next to that shows inflamed or infected skin with white blood cells populating the area and doing their thing. So neutrophils and wounds are actually different than neutrophils that are floating around in the plasma. Think of it like, again, I'm gonna use military um, analogies. Think of it like your special ops team, right? Your special ops team, when they're hanging out, you know, on base, just doing whatever, playing cards and waiting, that is a different special ops team than the one that gets activated. You know, suddenly they're in a stress mode, everything is serious, they're dead set, their eyes on, they're they've got all their uniform, their battle rattle, they're ready to go, as opposed to the special ops guys when they're playing cards or playing pool between deployments, right? So that it's still a neutrophil, but it's kind of a different neutrophil. It's ready to go, it's engaged, it's activated. So these promote angiogenesis or new blood flow to the area of injury or damage, stimulates growth of skin cells in this case, Fibroblasts are proliferate, and this is, you know, fiber literally is laid down, which then you can build. You can either add calcium to and make bone or keratinocytes and make skin, whatever. That's part of your remodeling and proliferative phase. And then you have expression of genes. And this is a real key. The neutrophils and the cytokines, the proteins they make, the whole function of those is, is to um, bring information and induce transformational changes at the genetic level. And that's when you start getting in trouble with uh, chronic inflammation. So basically, acute inflammation is activated innate immunity that then activates adaptive immunity. But this is supposed to be a very short-lived, like, here's your mission. You achieved your mission. You come home. This is You don't want this to become a protracted long-term conflict, which is what happens with chronic inflammation. And this sort of shows you, you know, this is a weird little graph, but it's pretty good. Um, the numbers on the bottom on the x-axis are hours. And then the y-axis shows you the phases of inflammation, okay? So up to three days is that very early phase of dropping the bombs, cleaning things up, getting things like acute inflammation when you have the redness, the heat, the swelling, the pain, okay? About three days. There's overlap, of course. Then you begin the remodeling, and then you begin the proliferative phase. Sorry, I got it back backwards. But anyway, you can see how this goes over time. Now, if you look, the uh, the first two phases, phase one, phase two, or late phase one, that'll go to about that 10-day, 14-day point. I actually try to, for my post-surgical patients or people healing from an injury, I try to have them avoid anti-inflammatories if they can for those first week or two because, you again, you want inflammation at that time, right? Um, you don't want to shut down the arachidonic acid uh, cascade too much because you need to get rid of the detritus or the debris and you need to kill the pathogens. Um, and then once you get out of that phase, then you don't want too much inflammation. So it's okay at that point. So once a neutrophil has served its purpose, it's engulfed the badness, it dropped the oxidative stress lysosome on it, cleaned up the debris. It is supposed to die at that point. It is programmed cell death, apoptosis. If it doesn't, if it just sits there and continues to produce bad proteins and continues to make these little lysosomes that then drop their stuff everywhere, that is chronic inflammation. 
normally a macrophage, which is a bigger kind of a phagocyte that comes in and phagocytizes or chews up and eats the neutrophil. Normally the macrophage will come in and clean up the cleaner upper, if that makes sense. The neutrophils go in and clean up first, then the macrophage comes in and takes care of that. And when it does it, it signals to the body, hey, we're done with this acute phase of inflammation. Let's move on. Let's start rebuilding this tissue. If it doesn't, then you don't enter that next phase of healing. And that's when you have problems. You don't have the right phenotype or type of macrophage that will induce healing. You have this type of macrophage that is continually inflammatory. And that's what we don't want. And we'll get into why in a minute. Uh, we have a question. The question is, if you get a white blood cell count with a differential or diff, will you be able to see if you have um, entered into an acute inflammatory phase? Yes. So for instance, when we're looking for infected total joints or infected knees, we'll take synovial fluid and send it off for a white cell with diff. And if you have a certain percentage of neutrophils, you can assume it's infected. Um, likewise, if you get a diff and it's high in eosinophils, you know you're having some sort of allergic response. So each one means a different thing. Uh, interestingly, if you don't have enough lymphocytes or a white blood cell count, we consider that a marker of malnutrition and that you're not going to do well after surgery. So yeah, you can tell sort of where you are in the phase, assuming that the person's immune system is on point. Now, if they don't have a good immune system, it's all up in the air, right? Um, but that's a good question. Okay, next. Okay, here's a chronic wound. This is what you don't want. Now, if I cut the bottom of my foot, it would hurt. A few days, it'd be swollen. Probably get a scab. Uh, I wouldn't want to walk on it like too different. You know, I wouldn't want to like toe walk for a while. But it would heal. It would take maybe a week, and it would be gone, right? But I'm not diabetic. This is what happens when you have a chronic wound and you have the inability to convert from acute to inflammatory. You have no normal tissues. Your immune system has been hacked and damaged, okay? Um, so this is what we're trying to avoid. And this picture, think of this picture. This is just a little skin wound, right? But this is what's going on in people with chronic inflammation in every cell and every system of the body in different ways. But it's that sort of badness that we want to avoid. <clears throat> so chronic inflammation. Why do we even have this? Why is this even possible in the human body? Well, it is. You know, maybe it's a design flaw. I don't know. I think it's just because we live way differently now than we're supposed to live in terms of um, the stressors we're exposed to and the foods we eat and whatnot. Um, but chronic inflammation is here and we need to figure out how to manage it. Honestly, we don't all know everything there is to know about it. I learn more every day. Um, and more and more studies are being done, but it's essentially not vital for any function, okay? I can't find anything good that chronic inflammation does. Now, if somebody knows of something good that chronic inflammation does, please send me that study because I'd love to read it. It's terrible for your system in general. It's only been discovered within the past few, whatever, decade or so, remember this. So we're just now figuring this out in medical science. Most NCDs, which is non-communicable chronic disease, so you can't catch it, like diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Most NCDs are due to chronic inflammation. So most of our modern societal problems in terms of health are due to chronic inflammation, which we just recently admitted to or discovered. But this has been going on for probably since the 50s, right? Diseases have gone up, obesity's gone up, inflammation's gone up, and there's a variety of theories as to why. Um, inflammation of prolonged duration in which active inflammation, tissue injury, and the healing process coexist. Unfortunately, the healing process is quite downregulated in chronic inflammation. I just want to briefly mention the PAMPs and the DAMPs. Okay, these are the damage associated molecular patterns and pathogen associated molecular patterns. So, the damage associated molecular patterns that's when you like have a cell rip apart or it's damaged by injury. Certain proteins go out from that situation and the immune cells recognize that. Similarly, if you have a virus or a bacteria enter, there's certain proteins on the shell that'll be recognized as non-self. So you, you have this like molecular pattern that induces inflammation, okay? So one of the problems with chronic inflammation state is we're constantly producing these molecular patterns for a variety of reasons with our damaged cells and altered protein structures and mutated DNA. Um, and so this is when you have 
the stimulus to induce this chronic inflammation. Even after a virus has left the scene, injuries left the body, you still have the ability to produce these molecular patterns and cause chronic inflammation. Okay, so let's talk about those causes and why maybe we're having all these troubles in our society today and why we spend billions in healthcare and nobody ever gets better. Uh, failure to eliminate a pathogen is the first reason to have chronic inflammation. So if you're harboring tuberculosis, some sort of low-grade fungal infection, some sort of uh, spore, some sort of yeast infection, parasites that are long-term, and viruses. So for instance, CMV, EBV, um, all of these long-term viruses that just sort of hang out and wait and then manifest under times of stress. Herpes is a perfect example. People have herpes, varicella, or like a chickenpox type of a virus, and then under times of stress, a, a sore will pop out or you'll get the shingles. So that's one way to get chronic inflammation. Exposure to irritants, environmental irritants, pollution, the air we breathe, the benzene in the air, the lead in the water, the other heavy metals in the water, radiation, poor diet, the primary cause, in my opinion, in our society. Um, autoimmune disorders. So if you've developed rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, MS, whatever, whatever autoimmune disease you have, mixed connective tissue disease of unknown significance. It's my personal favorite because it basically means we have no idea. We just know you're autoimmune. Um, you're constantly attacking yourself. You're under friendly fire all day long, every day. Mitochondrial failure, another primary cause of all of this, I think. So the mitochondria, and we're going to review it in a future, is the um, engine to the cell. If that fails, not only do you not produce the correct energy and signaling molecules for the rest of the cell to function properly, but you cause reactive oxygen species and all of those damage associated molecular patterns. So mitochondrial failure is a big deal that you don't wanna have. And then just generally increase reactive oxygen species because you don't have enough antioxidants on board. So all of these oxidative molecules are running around attacking things and doing what? Making these molecular patterns that are recognized as badness, inducing inflammation. Ages, which is not age like you think of, it's advanced glycation end products. So these are when sugar molecules from having an excess energy state or hyperglycemia attach to free proteins and create a monster protein. And that's an irreversible once it gets to that point of the advanced glycation end product. Those monster proteins damage DNA, damage cell membranes, attack proteins, change receptors, and induce the damage associated molecular pattern. There's actually receptors for these ages called RAGES, receptor for advanced glycation end products, uh, that also induce inflammation and genetic changes that damage self. And ages are all primarily from diet, honestly, dietary sources. And then also, if you're hyperglycemic, you make your own. Uh, one age that you may be familiar with is the HbA1c. So that is a marker of glycation of red blood cells. They turn over about every 120 days. So the a A1c is a way to measure the hyperglycemic state, the average for the past three months, because you can measure how many of these sugar molecules glycated the proteins in the red blood cell. Um, so it's all badness. You don't want that. Uric acid levels. If you have high uric acid levels, you're constantly inflamed. If you're running around with oxidized LDL or low density lipoprotein, LDL in and of itself is not a bad thing. You have to have it. It's how you transport free fatty acids around. If it gets oxidized, that is really bad. Or if you get too much of it, some doctors will say that's terrible. Some doctors in a lot of science is now saying that high LDL is not really terrible in, in terms of long-term morbidity, mortality, relative to the total cholesterol to HDL ratio. Um, but oxidized LDL is bad. <clears throat> Homocysteine, another marker of inflammation. So there's all kinds of systemic reasons, dietary, environmental, um, just any kind of exposure, either endogenous or exogenous, that can cause chronic low-grade inflammation. So does your lifestyle matter? Or do you just give up and say it is what it is? Um, it actually does matter. I think the estimate is, 92% of epigenetic modifications or changes that can affect how your future health is, is under your control. And only 8% is purely genetic. And twin studies have shown this too. So one twin study looked at 210 healthy twins between the ages of eight and 82. And they found that the non-hereditable or not the ones, the genetic factors are the largest contributors to systemic chronic inflammation. So in other words, two twins with different exposures to different environment, different diet, different exercise levels, different stress, et cetera, et cetera. 
the biggest contributor to their overall systemic chronic inflammation was that, not their DNA. So you can change almost all of these problems by changing how your DNA is methylated or modified or your epigenetics are changed. And a lot of that is by controlling the inflammation and the oxidative stress. I put this picture on just to show you, there's a great NASA study where they looked at the two twins, the Kellys, and one was up in space for, I don't know, almost a year and the other one wasn't. And they've been studying the difference of how like environment changes uh, genetics and response to injury and just general health. Um, NASA has this on their website. You should go check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, what they're doing in terms of that. But just so you know, starting in the womb, actually what your grandmother did can affect what happens in the womb. But what your mom ate and did and what she was exposed to in her stress level while you were in the womb started this process of a systemic chronic inflammation. So DNA can be methylated and changed and different genes turned on and off based on the foods that were eaten, the foods that are eaten, and then also, are you breathing polluted air? Are you drinking crap water or is your water healthy? Are you getting enough minerals? Are you getting enough micronutrients? All of this matters and it's all into your control. So let's deep dive into it and we'll talk about metabolic syndrome specifically right now. So metabolic syndrome is sort of the scourge of our society at the moment. That always, or not always, generally leads to diabetes. Um, I think something like, oh my goodness, let me remember this percentage right. I wanna say something like 80 to 90% of Americans are close to having metabolic syndrome, or at least a couple of the five things that you can't have uh, or that are metabolic syndrome. It's some ridiculously high percentage of Americans are falling into this category. Okay, so it's a thrombogenic state of being. What does that mean? That you're so inflamed that you're gonna be forming clots left and right in your body. Abdominal obesity, that's your waist circumference, arterial hypertension, insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, so high triglycerides, altered total cholesterol to HDL ratio, too much LDL, too much oxidized LDL, and cardiovascular disease. This is sort of the metabolic syndrome world. It used to be thought that adipose was just, oh, it's just a harmless little area where we store energy. No big deal. You can still be healthy and have a ton of adipose. That's okay. Well, but now we know it's actually an endocrine organ. It's a neuroendocrine organ. It's very biologically active. And too much adipose is extremely detrimental to your health. Uh, it's a secretory organ, meaning it's secreting cytokines all the time. And it is a potent source of hormones peptides and cytokines, which are the little proteins that induce inflammation and damage to tissue. Adipose is there for a purpose. A certain amount of adipose is needed. It cushions you, it cushions the organs, cushions the nervous system, and it does provide um, a stored efficient form of energy for when you're not eating, right? So that you can have fuel to keep going. The problem is when you never use the adipose and you keep adding on more and more adipose, Okay, it's supposed to be stored, used, stored, used, stored, used. Most of us are just storing, 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 storing. Okay, it regulates your food intake, your glucose, and your lipid metabolism. It's a source of inflammation, it's a source of your coagula coagulation factors in terms of communication or like inducing the thrombogenic state of being. And then the, uh, the cytokines that they produce are called adipokines, obviously. Uh, pro-inflammatory mostly. There are a few that are not inflammatory and actually healthy, but we only see those levels up if you have a normal amount of fat. If you have an excess energy state, you're producing bad guys, adipokines. I tell my patients all the time, look, your knees don't hurt and your feet don't hurt just because you have excess load, just because you're heavy. They hurt because your fat cells are producing inflammation and attacking yourself 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Like, what, of course you hurt. Um, if, if a normal sized person put on a weight vest, they would not hurt the same way somebody carrying around excess energy in the form of stored fat hurt because the weight vest isn't producing inflammation, but the adipose is, and that's the problem. Next. Oh, adipose is fat. So adipose is a technical name for the fat cell and there's white adipose, brown adipose. Brown adipose is um, good fat. It's uh, thermogenic and it's actually healthy for you. Uh, think about this, like, you know how when you go to the pool or the beach um, and the water is really, really cold and your kids never seem to notice or mind, 
all of their fat is mostly brown fat. And so they're constantly, it's metabolically active. They're producing energy from it and producing heat. As we get older, we have less and less of that good stuff. And we have more and more of this storage fat that is damaging us, okay? So adipose is the medical term for fat cells. Next. Hmm? Is that a question? Can you say it again? Oh, yeah, adipose. Think of adipose, it's not just a storage depot. It's not just holding calories for you. Adipose is actually, it becomes an organ in and of itself. It is sending out hormones, it is sending out proteins, it is sending out neurologic signals. So when you have too much of it, the system, our system is not set up for that. And it starts to become extremely damaging. Okay, so, well, what does fat make that's so bad? You might ask to yourself. Well, tumor necrosis factor alpha, IL-1 beta, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, transforming growth factor beta, plasminogen activator inhibitor, haptoglobulin, leptin, serum amyloid A, all this stuff is terrible, damaging. It's inducing inflammation and chronic inflammation, turning on genes you don't want turned on, turning off genes you don't want turned off. Okay, because you're in an excess energy state that the body was not ever meant to be in. Adiponectin is a good guy. So it normal or normal BMI people, I guess, or people with a healthy amount of fat that's supposed to be there, again, to cushion the organs, cushion the nerves, make things move smoothly. You have to have fat. Don't get me wrong. I don't want anybody to think that. You just can't have too much of it. That's not healthy. Um, adiponectin is highly anti-inflammatory, believe it or not. If you have a low adiponectin, that is strongly correlated with having a high CRP. Maybe your doctor's checking your CRP. Maybe they're not. They should be. Really, they should be checking your high sensitivity CRP. CRP is C-reactive protein. It is produced in the liver um, when you're in an inflamed state. And it is now known to be a very predictive marker of future cardiovascular events. So if you have a high sensitivity CRP that's not normal, uh, you got to get that under control quickly, or you're going to have an MI or some sort of issue like a stroke or something in the future. Um, it's, it's pretty predictive. <clears throat> so your adipose tissue is going to increase all the guys on the left, which are going to go to your non-communicable chronic disease states. Go on. So adipokines, remember these are cytokines produced by adipose cells. So the little um, messenger proteins that induce changes, induce inflammation, induce transformational change at the genetic level, but produced by fat cells, so adipokines. Um, highly inflamed, metabolically dysfunctional adipose, think of it that way. It's filled with macrophages. Remember I told you about the macrophages, good guys, bad guys? So these macrophages come into the new organ you've developed, the adipose organ. They infiltrate and then they just sit there and they get into that chronic state where they never become pro-healing. And they're producing these cytokines and chemokines or chemical messengers that, the, that sort of become a, a harbinger of badness or like just prophesying doom in your body. So the, the adipose tissues, just like they go into plaques in the arteries, when the macrophages go in and form foam cells, that's when things are really bad. Oxidized LDL, et cetera. So you get these adipo, uh, adipokines coming out from the fat cells, a lot of times from dead fat cells that never get cleaned up and sent away because they're just sort of like encapsulated in this new organ you've created with these macrophages that are always turned on for bad inflammation. So basically, over time, we have learned that the state of being where you have too much excess energy or you're obese is causally linked to the chronic low-grade inflammatory state, which is causally linked to the chronic non-communicable diseases. So it is important to get this excess energy state under control. And there's massive amounts of studying being done on this right now. Okay, so let's talk about, well, okay, so if we're just obese, can't we just treat the inflammation and be okay? Maybe. There's some studies that do support that. Here's one, a meta-analysis. And a meta-analysis is when somebody looks at a series of studies and they uh, sort of 
in a statistical method of course, and you know, of course you can make stats say anything, right? Statistically, they'll put the studies together to make it one big study so that the number of subjects is higher. Because uh, if you have a study of two people, that's essentially meaningless, right? But if you have a study of 200,000 people, now we're starting to get some actual data. So this meta-analysis of eight random randomized controlled trials looked at essentially 260 subjects, and they gave them anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha therapy. And uh, this was a group of overweight people with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is known to be associated with insulin resistance and, and adiposity or obesity too. Um, <clears throat> well, not always. So in this study, when they gave the people with rheumatoid arthritis the anti-TNF alpha therapy, there was a reduction in their insulin resistance. The, uh, the control of the inflammation in this case by controlling the cytokine TNF alpha did help. And also another study found that if rheumatoid arthritis patients are on atenarecept, which is um, a disease modifying agent that reduces the levels of certain cytokines that are inflammatory, they found that their risk of Alzheimer's was lower. So yes, controlling inflammation can be done and it is extremely important uh, to do if at all possible, but there's just much more natural, better ways to do than take these hugely, first of all, expensive. Second of all, your insurance probably won't cover them. Um, unless you have certain uh, indications like rheumatoid arthritis, right? Um, and fourth, they have a lot of side effects. But these studies do sort of hint to the fact that if you can control inflammation, you can protect people from Alzheimer's, you can protect them from insulin resistance, et cetera. Another double-blind placebo control trial of an interleukin-1 beta inhibitor. Remember, interleukin-1 beta is another one of those adipokines, another one of the inflammatory cytokines. Now, this was 10,000 adults that had a high CRP. Remember I told you that's predictive of future cardiovascular events? So this is actually a group of adults that had a high CRP and a history of MI. So these are very high-risk individuals. When they were given this particular medicine, they lowered the risk of MI, stroke, angina, and cardiovascular death as compared to pl placebo. Interestingly, there was no change in their LDL levels, which lends support to the growing mounting evidence that LDL may be irrelevant over time, overall for future mortality and morbidity. Um, so yeah, controlling inflammation is hugely important. Um, is there a magic pill for you to take? I don't think so yet. Are they working on it? For sure. We have a question. Um, so this is like that RA is, but RA flares, are they triggered by natural root triggers? The question is, are rheumatoid arthritis flares triggered by natural fruit sugars? Uh, if you're eating an orange or an apple or a banana and you're getting the fructose with the polyphenols, with the fiber and with all the other goodness that's in fruit, probably not. If you're eating a synthesized, purified, processed form of fructose, probably yes. So fructose, processed fructose, pure fructose is hugely terrible for you and induces inflammation uh, when taken into the system. It induces uric acid levels, actually, because of the way fructose is converted to energy. Um, and then you can induce inflammation that way. But whole foods, natural foods that actually you can pull off of a tree and eat, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Oh, yeah, if you can share this talk with your friends. Um, and give us some feedback on future subjects you want to hear about. All right, going on. So, so back to history, because I think this is interesting. There's a doctor in Italy, I think it was in Italy, J.B. Morgagni, and he actually talked about visceral adiposity 250 years ago. So remember how you, you've heard that central fat or uh, core fat is the bad fat? If you carry your fat on your hips, you're, you're okay. Not really. But Core fat really means that you probably have a lot of fat on your viscera or around your organs, and that's the really metabolically badly active fat. He talked about this 250 years ago, okay? But for some reason, surgeons, doctors, the pharmaceutical industry, nobody really cared. They weren't concerned about it. Only now are we talking about this. And in fact, even today, proponents of lifestyle and diet and using food as medicine and using micronutrients as medicine are vilified generally by their peers. And, you know, if you don't do a single molecule double blind study in some academic center where you never actually deal with real people who have to go to the grocery store, take care of the kids, go to work and be stressed out all day, 
uh, then you're not really doing any science. But I, I disagree with that. I mean, we've known about this now for at least 250 years, and we're just now starting to tell you guys about it, which is horrible, I think. Uh, he figured it out from anatomic dissections. Remember, he didn't have any other tools. He found all of this obesity in the organ when he dissected specimens. He figured out about hypertension. He found gout. And he noticed obstructive sleep apnea was correlated to all of this. So let's bring it back to today. Only in 1998, think about that. That's not very long ago. Did the World Health Organization even describe a definition of metabolic syndrome? So although this guy described it 250 years ago, Nobody admitted it to it until the 90s now, and only now are we actually studying it for you guys. Um, but I'm gonna give you some, I'm gonna tell you some things you can do to control this yourself coming up. Okay, this picture, that is Morgogny right there. So he was alive 1628 to 1771. This image is um, amazing. And it shows you, I call it the fat suit, sort of. If you did cross-sectional dissections, the yellow globby looking stuff outside the red muscles, that is adipose tissue. So that's your white adipose tissue that is external to the organs, but look around the liver and the spleen and the intestines. There's a ton of fat packed in there being uh, excessively active and producing adipokines. This is his quote. Those who have dissected or inspected many bodies have at least learned to doubt, while others who are ignorant of anatomy and do not take the trouble to attend to it are in no doubt at all. And the reason I like this quote is because you don't know what you don't know until you know what you don't know. It doesn't make any sense, right? But the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know anything. And that's what he's talking about here. So the people who are so hard and fast in their thoughts that, you know, Arthritis is not inflammatory. It's only injury derived or wear and tear. Or fat is not bad. Fat's okay. It's healthy. It's just excess source. People that are so hardcore in their beliefs probably just haven't learned enough. I mean, every, like I said, every day I learn more and I've changed my mind about a lot of things over time as I read more and more studies. You have to keep an open mind and be aware of this. But I will tell you the one thing that doesn't change, the healthiest people, the people that live the longest, the people that have optimal aging and can play with their great, great, great grandkids successfully, they are not chronic, chronically inflamed and they don't have oxidative stress. And there's certain reasons why. Next. Okay. So remember I told you the mitochondrial health is important. Let's talk about that real briefly, really briefly. Chronic inflammation will damage your mitochondria. You have to have functioning mitochondria or you're never going to function. You're useless. Without mitochondria, you cannot convert food into usable energy. That's the refinery or the engine of your cell. Um, it takes food and makes it into what's called ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is a usable form of energy at the cellular level. Quality control of the mitochondria is mandatory to have a properly balanced metabolism and to produce energy. Damaged mitochondria will make too many reactive oxygen species. If you watch the talk about oxidative stress, the byproduct or the exhaust from your engine making the ATP for energy is reactive oxygen species. Some of these are good. They're signaling molecules. The problem is if you have an imbalance, too many of these electrons that are running around damaging cells and not enough antioxidants that will attach to these loose electrons and neutralize them, that's when you start getting into trouble. Um, <clears throat> the reactive oxygen species can activate inflammatory proteins and make the problem worse, meaning more reactive oxygen species and more inflammation can damage lipid membranes, which every cell is surrounded by a lipid membrane and all the receptors that allow things in and out and make changes and actually make a cell functional. Uh, that lipid membrane will be damaged by reactive oxygen species and you, will, you basically have a dysfunctional cell can mutate DNA, change your DNA. It can mutate proteins, change receptors, change the function of receptors, turn on the wrong genes, turn off the right genes. So you don't want this to happen. You got to keep your mitochondrial healthy. Otherwise you'll have, remember the damps we talked about, you will have an accumulation of your damage associated molecular patterns, which do what? Increase inflammation and damage to more cells. And then the, you will activate the pathogen receptor reactors. Okay. The, the, you have the DAMPs, damage associated, the PAMPs, pathogen associated. All of this gets turned on, and you're basically in this chronically inflamed state where you're self-attacking all the time. So mitochondrial quality control, hugely important, avoiding exogenous sources of, um, you know, things like pollution and bad diet, hugely important. Go on. 
And uh, just briefly, this is just showing you on the right slide. It's just interesting that you can't see it, but just look how many little words there are. That is just a short list of some of the damage associated molecular patterns and their receptors. So this is going on all the time in me and you, and you got to try to control it as much as you can. Next. So quick review, what are the mitochondria? We think, we meaning science, think that it's from bacteria that harbored in our cells forever ago. So it's actually sort of like a bacteria that became part of us um, because there's my, the mitochondria have their own DNA. There's mitochondrial DNA and then there's cellular DNA. Mitochondria are undergoing constantly fusion and fission. So they're either combining to each other in an effort to produce more energy and become more efficient or they're breaking apart and becoming two different ones, either to clean up a poorly functioning part of one, or if you need more than a few mitochondria, you know, if, if the body senses it needs more mitochondria in this particular area, for instance, endurance running muscle will say, you want more mitochondria, or you're gonna fuse them together to make the mitochondria more efficient. It's the energy production portion of your cell, we talked about that, so all bioenergetics start and end with the mitochondria more or less. And then the damaged mitochondria, you will have loss of membrane potential. What's that? Well, the way it makes energy is it basically, I'm going to shorten the electron transport chain to this for you. It'll put a bunch of protons on one side of a membrane. They're not on the other side. Nature does not like this. Nature wants everything balanced. And it'll drop the protons through until there's an equal number on both sides. And that process of dropping the protons through, they go through this thing called ATP synthase that is like a generator that spins. And that's where you create your ATP. So if you don't have that membrane potential, meaning more protons on one side and less on the other side, you can't make energy. So decrease ATP production, decrease oxidative phosphorylation, and then you just start getting into more and more trouble in energy production, and you're starting to produce more and more reactive oxygen species because everything is just totally messed up. Go ahead. Okay, so I don't want to pound on this, but it is important for you to understand how important mitochondrial health is to non-communicable chronic diseases and chronic inflammation. So a couple ways you have quality controls, mitophagy and apoptosis. Some of these mitochondria, you, you know, are programmed to die at a certain time or a cell is programmed to die at a certain time for a certain reason. Well, that's okay. You want that. The body's set up for that. Uh, the problem is if, if a cell dies and it doesn't convert into an unactive cell and get you know, chewed up and taken away by the immune system. If it's just sitting there still biologically active, but yet not functioning like it's a normal cell, it's just shooting out proteins, cytokines and inflammation. You don't want that. Um, mitophagy is when the body will go in and clean up poor functioning mitochondria, mitochondria with a bad cell potential, mitochondria that don't have the right amount of proteins or the ATP synthase isn't working or whatever reason. If you have um, a part of your factory that's not working, you know, the body will shut it down, clean it up, do some maintenance, and then the factory works better, right? If you don't have this process of continually cleaning up damage and maintaining the system, then those damaged molecules start to induce more and more inflammation because it's the damage associated molecular pattern we talked about. Mitophagy is what you want or what, why people do, uh, you probably heard about people doing cold bathing, getting into saunas, intermittent fasting, high intensity exercise. All of these short-term stressors are inducing mitophagy or letting your body clean up. Failure of quality control of mitochondria will lead to Alzheimer's, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, you name it. The damaged mitochondria contribute to chronic inflammation through the DAMPs and the PAMPs or the pathogen receptors, okay? They activate the signaling of inflammation and that activates something called NFK beta, which is nuclear factor kappa beta, which goes to the gene level and turns on the bad genes and turn off, turns off the good genes, okay? And I'm talking about everything from like your longevity genes to genes that, you know, cause certain proteins to be made that damage the cell membrane. So less mitophagy induces what is called an inflammasome. So if you're not cleaning up these damaged, poorly functioning cells constantly and keeping the system clean and maintaining the factory, the factory becomes less and less efficient and induces more and more inflammation. <clears throat> and depending on where your poorly functioning mitochondria are, that is what your disease is. So if you've got terrible mitochondria in your cartilage, you're gonna get arthritis. If you've got terrible mitochondria in the brain, you're gonna get these neurodegenerative disorders, so on and so forth. Next. Okay, 
So what is the connection of inflammation, mitochondrial health, and non-communicable diseases? Well, finally, the World Health Organization is catching on to this. And, you know, they talk about the four by four framework. So four things that they've pretty much said or admitted are not good for human health. Tobacco use, harmful or excessive alcohol use, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity. So those four, if you have a certain or all of them, God forbid, matrix increases your risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, cancer, arthritis, so on and so forth. The Lancet, which is a, a good medical journal, put an analysis of about 120,000 people out. And this is interesting. So if you're mildly obese, uh, that must mean a BMI of 30 or 31, I can't remember exactly, versus severely obese, okay, or morbidly obese. Mild obesity means you're going to lose one in 10 disease-free years. So 10% of your disease-free life or your health span is going to be gone with just mild obesity. If you're severely obese, you're losing 25% of your disease-free years. 25% of your health span is gone just from holding too much energy. Next slide. Yeah, it is intense. Agreed. It, it's you should not take excess energy um, lightly. Yes. Next slide. I've been instructed to reiterate the twenty-five percent. It is important, though. So think about this. So I operate on people with diabetes a lot that have different chronic problems from the diabetes, particularly foot problems, like wounds, like you saw before. And a lot of them are severely obese. So they have BMIs of 50, sometimes even 60. Okay. Normal BMI, by the way, is like up to 26, I think, 27. So think about that, double that. Um, they are losing 25% of their health span. So let's say your health span genetically, remember 8% is controlled by genes, 92% is controlled by you. Let's say genetically, all things being perfect, you were going to live to be 100. Well, just by being obese, never mind if you add any of this other terribleness to your life, like pollution, radiation, tobacco, et cetera, uh, just being severely obese, you're going to lose 25 years of that. So you may, even if you live to 100, which you probably won't, uh, it would be a terrible 25 years from 75 to 100. So my goal for my patients and me is optimal aging. We're all aging. It's not going to end. Everyone on this planet has died to date. No one's lived forever. So we know that's inevitable as well. Um, what we're trying to change is how long you live healthy, active, and able to do things that you want to do and cognitively intact. Because that is everybody's goal. We all want to stick around. And like I said, you want to play with your great, 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 great grandkids if you can. It's an exaggeration, obviously. But you get my point. So you got to control the excess energy state because a lot of it begins and ends with that. Next slide. So let's talk about arthritis. Now I'm an orthopedic surgeon. And one of the reasons I started getting interested in all of this is I did not think that we surgeons were really moving the needle in terms of population health or really getting people better in general. Sure, we do some cool surgeries and there's, you know, we do a lot of biomechanical studies showing the strength of this suture anchor versus that suture anchor or the wear quality of this piece of plastic in a total knee versus that piece of plastic in a total knee. But when you take a step back and look at the big picture, the rates of pain have never decreased, they've gone up. This is people complaining of pain. The rates of disability have not decreased, they've gone up. The rates of pain medicine use have not decreased, they've gone up. The rates of malaise and depression and fatigue from pain, they, ha they haven't gotten better, they've gone up. Despite the fact that we are technologically better and better and better, more and more proficient, uh, better systems, uh, better drugs, what have you. So I, I took a step back and I, I started thinking, what, what are we doing? And that's when I started going down this path of what is really going on here? And what I find fascinating is while the guys in the cardiovascular world, hypertension world, bariatric or obesity world, diabetes world, most, not most, a lot of them are starting to come around to this chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, excess energy being the source of, of all problems, the foundation of modern disease. But for some reason, the arthritis world, this hasn't caught on yet. And I still get told by faculty, peers, um, 
people I work with that, oh, you're in a creek, it's not inflammatory. What are you talking about? It's just the load from them being heavy. And it's, it's just wear and tear. They had an injury I'm telling you that they, this is not being admitted yet, but I think osteoarthritis is, is a systemic disease that is just manifesting in the genes. I mean, in the joints, just like diabetes is a systemic disease that manifests at your insulin levels. And then of course, will damage peripheral things like nerves and retina and things like that, biologically active cells. So we know now that arthritis always thought of as degenerative and wear and tear. We're actually learning more and more that it is more akin to the inflammatory condition than, than we before suspected. So there were early, the problem was before, before we had newer tools, there were observations that there were fewer white blood cells in the synovial fluid of somebody with arthritis versus somebody with rheumatoid arthritis. But that was before we really started understanding biomarkers. And to be honest, we don't really have a great biomarker yet for this. We're working on it. Uh, but just looking at basic white blood cells, the people with RA had more than the people with OA. So at that point, it was just decided and it became dogma at that point that osteoarthritis is not inflammatory, even though itis is at the end of it. And it is degenerative and wear and tear. Well, now we know it's innate immune activation from cartilage damage. And the cartilage damage can be from anything, from mitochondrial poor health to systemic attack because of chronic inflammation, because of poor diet or tobacco use or whatnot. And it can be from injury. But a lot of arthritis is systemically brought on by inflammatory proteins, just like when adipose produces adipokines. They don't just attack the atherosclerotic plaque or damage the cell membranes uh, in the heart muscle. They're also attacking the cartilage, the tendons, the ligaments, and the connective tissue and causing what we think of as arthritic pain. So the state of chronic low-grade inflammation that manifests in joints, muscle, and connective tissue, that is arthritis. It is not a degenerative wear and tear disease, although it's often thought of that. Why? Because it manifests at 50, 60, 70 years old. Well, that's when all of this stuff always manifests in all of the different systems, because it does take a number of years for this inflammation to do its thing. A high sensitivity CRP is strongly associated with a progression of knee arthritis. That's been shown in studies. So again, high sensitivity CRP is a marker for a future cardiovascular event. If you have a high CRP, you can pretty much assume you probably have arthritis too, and you're going to have a future musculoskeletal event as well. And then they've done studies where when they did total, this is a picture of somebody getting a total knee arthroplasty or a, a total knee put in. That's the knee's been opened up and bent, and that device is on the end of the femur bone, and they're about to cut off the damaged cartilage and then put in metal and plastic. And that's the best we can do right now. We basically remove your joint and put in metal and plastic. Think about that. Anyway, when they sent off samples of this to the lab, they noted high levels of CRP and IL-6 in the synovitis of total knee patients, but yet nobody called it inflammatory. And only now are we beginning to understand this. Next. We have a question of how do we fix this on a daily basis other than getting our weight in a normal range? I'm gonna talk about potential treatment modalities coming up. But it, just so you know, it is important to get the weight under control. I know that's the hardest thing in the world to do. I've got plenty of family members that struggle with this. Um, certainly I'm not perfect, nobody's perfect, but there are more and more tools coming out to help with weight loss. And we can talk about that in another talk maybe. Things like time-restricted feeding, um, certain types of diet. And I'm gonna talk about a diet that I think is good. Um, bariatric surgery. Interestingly, go to the next slide, but I'll say this. The outcomes of bariatric surgery for knee arthritis, for knee pain, the outcomes of bariatric surgery are as good or better than total knee surgery. Think about that. And you get to keep your own knee. Okay. So the impact of chronic inflammation on joints and connective tissues. And connective tissues are literally what they sound like. So you've got fascia going from the skin inward and then up and down and sideways and all attached to each other. That's what lets everything stay connected and move well. So connective tissue will get inflamed just like joints, just like tendons, just like ligaments. And it can happen without injury. You don't have to have an injury to get arthritis. Another common myth that I would like to dispel. So synovial cells, that's the lining of a joint. So certain joints are called synovial joints. And each joint has, think of it like a water balloon around the joint which holds the fluid and lets the joint move smoothly. 
that is lined with synovial cells. The synovial cells will release interleukin-1, which is very pro-inflammatory, and they'll also uh, recruit matrix metalloproteinases, okay? One of the treatments I do in my clinic for people is we'll inject this substance called alpha-2 macroglobulin, and that is essentially a matrix metalloprotease inhibitor, and it's miraculous the amount of pain relief it gives people. Why? Because it's attacking the foundational problem, which is inflammation in the joint. So if you can control that, you can control the pain. And then hopefully, ideally, you control disease progression. Because the MMPs are what are degrading and degenerating cartilage. And then remember what I told you, induce the inflammation and arthritis, damage cartilage will also damage synovial cells. So if you've got synovial cells producing these cytokines that bring in the matrix metalloproteinases that damage cartilage, you begin to have this vortex or this spiral that's just going nowhere good. So that we got to stop the chronic low grade inflammation or your arthritis is not going to get better. So think of it more like a whole organ disease of the joint. It's not just a cartilage. It's a bone around the cartilage. It's the ligaments. It's a tendon. It's a joint capsule. It's synovial cells. Okay. Now this slide I love and uh, the bottom gives you the reference, but I thought this is a great little heat map that shows you the level of inflammation normal on the left where it's more yellow and blue. Okay. And then you get serum or the blood of people with arthritis. Then you get the synovial fluid of people with arthritis. Then you have serum of people with rheumatoid. And I'm presuming this is untreated rheumatoid. And then the synovial fluid of people with rheumatoid. You can see the progression. So, th so the synovial fluid of arthritis is really not that different than the synovial fluid of rheumatoid. Although I will say the rheumatoid is definitely more inflamed in terms of the markers that we know to check or that we have the ability to check. But um, you're still massively inflamed. It's, a, it's a, quite an inflammatory condition. You would have to agree with that. Just look at the red. Red is bad. Yellow is okay. The, uh, this is a problem a lot of times, too. We'll do blood markers, right? Oh, your IL-6 and your TNF-alpha is okay in your um, serum, so you don't have arthritis. Well, not so much. We probably should all be checking synovial fluid. But that's hard to do And if your insurance even lets it happen. Okay. All right, and this just shows you, again, on the sort of spectrum of joint problems. You probably can't see this, but you've got osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis. I would probably chalk into that, things like lupus and whatnot. Gout, hugely inflammatory condition that is massively common in this country, hyperuricemia. And then uh, the spondylitic arthropathies, things like um, ankylosing spondylitis and people that form spurs everywhere. So basically, all of these disease processes are just a different type of the same foundational problem, which is too many inflammatory cytokines self-attacking. All right, next. So the normal synovium, the normal lining of a joint is about two to three cell layers thick, and there's no inflammatory cells normally. So if you don't have arthritis or you, you're pretty healthy eating, you're not exposed to a lot of toxins, and you don't have a chronically inflamed state, your synovial will be synovial lining will be very thin, no inflammatory cells. Inflamed synovium has been found to be very thick, so it thickens up. And remember that picture of the skin I showed you before, inflamed skin? It just gets packed with these other cells. And you'll find in there macrophages, T and B cells, which are part of the adaptive immune system, mast cells and natural killer cells, which are part of the innate immune system, all packed into the synovial lining. Doing what? Why are they there? Well, because you have inflammation and it's attacking your joint. So senescent cells, okay, what are these? You probably have heard of this or maybe you haven't. Senescent is sort of planned death or a dead cell. Um, and remember I told you before, apoptosis is normal cellular death as part of a normal physiologic process. The trick is you gotta get rid of that apoptotic cell or if it's gonna stay there, it becomes a senescent cell that's just there but not really doing what it's supposed to do. That can go either into a bad senescent cell, and it'll have what's called a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, sort of just start secreting badness, just like adipose secretes badness all day. And then that'll induce the chronic inflamed state. So if you have senescent cartilage cells sitting in your joint, you're going to be sending out those damaged molecular patterns all day long, every day in cytokines. And then it's just a self-propagating, it's, it's predictable. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. For years, surgeons have known 
that there are presence of senescent cells or dead cells that aren't really doing anything but being there in the joint. Um, again, from studies where they just take pieces of cartilage from total knee patients and put it into a repository, which is actually good because they're at least admitting we don't know what we don't know. So like at LSU, they do this a lot. They'll take pieces of cartilage and synovial and send it to the lab, and it's just sort of stored there for future studies. Well, now we're starting to figure out what this means. So these senescent cartilage cells and senescent cells in the synovium and all the connective tissue around the joint, they're not just dead cells doing nothing. They're biologically active and they're causing chronic inflammation, which further damages cartilage and induces inflammatory proteins that hurt and damages the nerve cells that come up under the subchondral plate and, and are near the cartilage. Cartilage does not have nerves, by the way. Your cartilage does not hurt. It's all of the tissue around that is what's hurting. Yeah, we're getting there now. I don't want to leave out tendons. I think tendons are forgotten a lot. I pulled this article because this was from Nature and it's relatively recent. Nature is kind of a good journal. And they were talking about tendinosis, damaged connective tissue from, again, inflammation. But notice on their treatment list, they don't even mention anything except non-steroidals in terms of managing chronic inflammation. Just physical therapy, which is a great treatment, don't get me wrong. Orthotics, injection, shockwave therapy, surgery, and then NSAIDs. Problem with NSAIDs is they're single molecule cyclooxygenase inhibitors, and they'll destroy your gut biome, and they can cause kidney problems, and they can cause um, gastric bleeds and ulcers. So I'm not the biggest fan of NSAIDs, although I'll prescribe them if they're needed, um, but I much prefer people to take natural things. But anyway, <clears throat> I wanted you to know that this inflammation hits all types of connective tissue. Okay, just the only important thing about this slide is for you to know there have been a lot of studies now that link periodontitis, right, inflamed gums. If you have that, that is a marker that you've got pending cardiovascular disease, believe it or not. I look at arthritis as a similar thing because this is a systemic problem and it's not just, you don't just have arthritis. Most people with arthritis also have something else that has to do with chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. And all of this links to the same things, macular degeneration, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, diabetes, you name it, it's all the same essential problem. It just manifests a little bit differently. So let's talk about aging really quickly and then we'll get to the treatments. Complex changes in the immune system, okay? It becomes dysfunctional over time and you have increases in what's called inflammation. So when the immune system becomes dysfunctional and starts self-attacking, lack of ability to recognize pathogen versus self cell, chronic inflammation, the senescent or dead cells that just induce the inflammasome, remember all those cytokines and the secretome that cause problems. This is what aging does. And it's, but it's not mandatory. It doesn't have to happen this way. We can control it and make our B and T cells and our natural killer cells and our neutrophils and our other immune cells, they can be highly functioning up into your 90s and 100s. It's been shown. It's been proven. It's just most of us aren't doing it for ourselves. Next slide. I know everybody wants to get to what to do. What to do. All right. All right. We're going to answer the questions in a minute. So normal cell becoming a senescent cell, okay? The, so senescence, why do you have dead cells in there, you're wondering to yourself? Nobody's running in there with in like shooting the cells. It's just that there's a limit to the number of times a cell can divide before it stops dividing. This has only been known for a couple of decades, although it was predicted well before that. And then chronic inflammation is the key to when that cell that just stops dividing becomes dead or senescent, okay? I guess you could think of it like a comatose cell. That comatose cell is either gonna sit there and not be harmful, or it'll get cleaned up and taken away, or it becomes harmful. Chronic inflammation is the key to when it becomes harmful and not just a normal senescent cell. And we're honestly learning more and more about this. I don't think anybody's really mastered senescence or senescent cells, but this is a big area of anti-aging research. Okay. Optimal aging. Okay. So in 1881, this guy Weissman stated that, quote, death pl takes place because a worn out tissue cannot forever renew itself. And because a capacity for increase by means of cell division is not everlasting, but finite, end quote. No one thought he was right for about 80 or more years. And only in the past 20 years have we really delved into this. This Dr. Hayfleck in 1961 showed that yes, there are a finite number of cell divisions predicted in 1881 
but they call it the Hayflick limit, not the Weissman limit, because he actually had a lab where he could actually show it, and that's just how science works. Um, anyway, the non-dividing cell, the senescent cell, will become dangerous if it starts to secrete this badness, and it'll, and it'll induce chronic inflammation. They can be non-dangerous, okay? It's just you, you, you don't want to turn on the senescent cell to become dangerous. And again, we're learning more and more about this. So the aging gut has a lot to do with this and the aging immune system. So if you can keep your immune system optimized, and that's things like D3, proper nutrition, exercise, et cetera. Also, your biome, the bacteria that are populating your gut, hugely important. Most older people decrease their nutritional status. They just start eating very poorly and not getting enough micronutrients. And then the gut biome changes where it's not very immune tolerant and a certain type of bacteria induce a leaky gut, which lets um, LPS or lipoprotein lipopolysaccharide come in, things that induce inflammation are allowed to get through the intestines. Um, and so, and I'm obviously glossing over a lot of what's important about the biome. We can talk about that later. Um, but basically, if you can manipulate the gut biome in older people, you can actually make them healthier and make their immune system better um, just by controlling the bacteria in the gut because it's so hugely important to the functioning of every other part of your system. So none of this is mandatory. You don't have to age poorly. Okay, chronic inflammation in neuronal cells in the aging brain, that induces the inflammasome, okay? This is mostly the atrocyte and glial cells. Those are the support cells in the brain that turn over a bit more than neuronal cells. There's very little, if any, neuronal cell turnover, um, but the support cells do. And so those can become inflammatory inducing if a senescent glial cell sits there and starts to spew out its secretome. Um, brain inflammation, either from poor diet, chronic stress, mental stress, um, pollution, et cetera. You have all these increased reactive oxygen species. Those damage the neurons. They damage the mitochondria in the neurons. You have the damage associated molecular pattern. All of this inflammation and reactive oxygen species in your brain can increase the tau in the amyloid deposits, which are highly associated with Alzheimer's. And many people have, or many people, many studies have found that the people that have these cognitive decline issues and neuroinflammation disorders, they have a low antioxidant status. So again, back to the aging and the nutrition and the gut biome, if you're letting in more oxidative stress and you're not taking in enough antioxidants from a really good healthy diet or supplements, obviously you're going to have a pro-accident overload over time and your brain will get damaged. And that's just been shown over and over and over again. Most chronic brain issues are considered inflammatory at this point. Some are genetic, don't get me wrong, but even in those cases, a lot of the symptoms can be controlled by controlling inflammation. So the aging brain, chronic inflammation is tied to mid and late life dementia, okay? Curbing inflammation can help you delay or prevent cognitive decline. And then, Again, back to the high sensitivity CRP, which I strongly suggest you go get checked if you haven't done it. If you have a high, high sensitivity CRP, it's predictive of future cardiovascular events. It's associated with progression of arthritis. And now here we see that it's linked to changes in white matter in the brain. And that was shown at Hopkins. So I can't stress enough how important it is to control inflammation. Next. High sensitivity CRP. There's two ways to test CRP, a basic CRP, and then they have a newer, more accurate way called the high sensitivity CRP. Yeah, that's one of the primary markers that should be checked. Next. Thank you. Okay, what are our treatment options? Uh, sleep, good sleep, good diet. Minimize your stress, exercise, and avoid badness. Simple, right? I mean, it seems like such common sense, but it just sounds so overwhelming and hard to do, right? It's so hard to get good sleep. It's so hard to eat well. How do you minimize stress in America today? I mean, you just have to stick your head in the sand. Exercise, who's got time for that? And avoiding badness, it's forced upon you. I'm gonna give you some stuff, some tricks you can do. All of that leads to chronic infections, Physical inactivity, that's going to lead to obesity along with eating too much, excess energy, and poor diet, and we'll talk about that. Um, dysbiosis, that's when you mess up your gut biome. Ultra-processed foods, we're going to talk about that. Isolation, one of the primary drivers of mental stress. Everybody was just forced into two years of isolation. When do we see the manifestations of that stress coming up? 
disturbed sleep, okay? So it's gonna lead to all of these problems which we already talked about. Uh, yes? A uh, question about CRP? There are, the question is, what if your physician won't order a high sensitivity CRP for you? Which sadly, I think is probably a common state. A lot of physicians are employed by hospital systems now and groups, it's hot. A lot of hospital systems and groups and um, a lot of them are told what they're allowed to do or not allowed to do and a lot of that is based on cost, right? So a lot of them will get dinged by their system or disciplined if they order too many lab tests, particularly expensive ones. So let's say your physician is in one of those sort of groups and he, he or she can't do what you need them to do. Then what I would say is there's plenty of companies now, if you can't find another physician to do it, that you can, uh, you can get blood work done, send it to them, and then they'll issue a report to you. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different ones. There's one called Inside Tracker, and there's a few more. But you can get this done through third-party companies. Um, but your insurance probably won't cover that unless you have a health, health savings account, a HSA. So that's the problem, right? In America, we're not going to, the health insurance companies aren't going to pay for all this preventative stuff. It's kind of a sad state of being. But you can do it cash pay third party if you want. In fact, if you probably walked into a LabCorp request, just said, I want a high sensitivity CRP, what's the cash price? They'd probably do it. Maybe not, depending on your state. They may still require a physician's order, but there's plenty of third party lab companies that don't. If you have high CRP, what should be done by your doctor? Well, your doctor should get you on an anti, figure out why are you inflamed? Is it uric acid? Do you have excess energy state or are you obese? Do you, um, you know, what's the reason for this inflammation in your life? Is it just mental stress? Do you have some low grade infection that's never gone away? Um, are you eating a poor, highly processed, terrible diet? Um, are you smoking? Are you giving yourself, are you radiated? Like, why do you have all this stress? And then once the cause or the source is noted, then you can start to manage that is what I would say. You know, in long-term studies of morbidity and mortality or death or problems from cardiovascular disease, um, one of the only things that's really been shown to move the needle to really prolong life and reduce complications is transcendental meditation. Why? Because it controls mental stress for people, which is far more powerful than the statins, far more powerful than most medicines or pharmaceuticals. If you can just control your mental stress, get good sleep, eat, a better diet. It doesn't have to be a perfect diet, but it's got to be better than what we're normally eating here in this country. I mean, you are 80% there. It sounds simple, hard to do, but not that hard to do. So sleep. What happens when you sleep at night? The substance that builds up during the day that signals to your brain that you're awake called adenosine, it builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up. You sleep, your body clears it all out. Well, then you start fresh the next day. It builds up, builds up, builds up. So you got to keep clearing out the adenosine. If you don't get enough sleep, it keeps building up, clogs up, messes up, gums up the works. Think of it that way. All of the reactive oxygen species we talked about that induce things like Alzheimer's and cognitive decline, problems like that, uh, all of that gets detoxed at night. That's when you have your mitophagy, your autophagy, your cleanup systems. Everything gets taken care of. It only happens when you're asleep. The neuroplasticity happens and memories are cemented. So this is when learning really takes place at night when you're asleep. This is why it's so important for school age kids to get a good night's sleep. One of the things about life today that drives me crazy are all these activities that have kids that are like eight or nine years old out playing softball or soccer till nine or 10 at night when we know that all of the brain development happens at sleep and they need like 10 or 11 hours. And then the cells maintain themselves. Your mitochondria health improves. All of this is managed by your levels of melatonin and levels of light. So shift work, one of the worst things in the world, reduces lifespan, clearly shown. Um, every cell in your body has a clock that's managed by the big clock cells in the brain, managed by melatonin and UVB and UVA rays. So deep sleep and REM sleep, hugely important. Levels of REM sleep, amount of REM sleep, very highly correlated to death rates. So if you don't sleep well, 
your likelihood of dying sooner and worse is higher. Most human adults need seven to nine hours of sleep. A lot of people will tell you they only need three hours of sleep. They're wrong. You need about seven to nine hours. Could there be outliers on that curve? Maybe, but it takes a certain amount of time to clear out the adenosine and do all this de detox process and neuroplasticity. I mean, the genes have to be turned on. They have to form certain proteins. The proteins have to become active. They have to do their thing. So this doesn't happen like this. So three hours of sleep is not enough. And then changing your circadian rhythm constantly is horrible for people, but it is what it is for a lot of people in this country. So how do you get good sleep? So first of all, don't have sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea, get it managed. If you snore or you think you have sleep apnea or you just want to go get a sleep study, you got to do it. And CPAPs are annoying, but they are life-saving. So first, don't have sleep apnea. Second big trick to sleep is the core body temperature. Your body temperature has to drop to get good deep sleep um, by a couple of degrees. So 65 degrees in the room is optimal if you can do it. Some people will think that if you take an ice bath right before bed, you're cooling yourself off. But actually what you're doing is you're triggering to the body to increase the temperature of the core. It's a stress response, the opposite of what happens with hot. So if you get in a sauna, your core temperature goes down because your body's responding to the external environment. So avoid ice baths or cold showers before bed because that's really inducing an increase in your core body temperature. So you wanna sleep 65 degrees or less. Uh, you don't wanna have sleep apnea. You wanna have a solid routine that follows the circadian rhythm, if at all possible. You want a dark room. Ideally, no light, because even a tiny little light will mess up your melatonin patterns. If you need light, like if you have to get up to go to the bathroom, try to have red lights or amber lights, because they don't induce melatonin as much as blue light or bright lights. Avoid screens at night if you can. Make sure, your t if you have a TV in the room, make sure that all the settings are on warm and they're low blue light settings, and you can do that in the settings feature under um, picture on most modern TVs. Um, you want to avoid alcohol within a few hours of sleep if you can. Now, most people think that alcohol helps them fall asleep, which it does, but mostly because it's helping you sort of pass out. What happens with alcohol is it fragments your sleep and you actually reduce your rapid eye movement sleep, which we know is linked to all-cause mortality. So, you know, a glass or two of wine every day is fine per the Mediterranean diet, right? But you just don't want to have it too close to bedtime. So those are just some tricks to trying to get good sleep. Hugely important for health. Dietary factors, probably my favorite topic. Um, preventative nutrition matters. Medicine is, or food is medicine. And this is where you can really take control of your health. So I love the Mediterranean diet. I think it's been the most studied. It's got the most history. Remember I told you a lot of these lab studies are on these really weird inbred mouse that make no sense when you try to translate it to humans. Um, but that's the standard in our country. Really the only long-term human studies uh, are really, a lot of them are on Mediterranean diet. So we already have all these massive long-term population studies. Sure, they're not perfectly well controlled. And sure, you don't monitor every single thing somebody eats and all of their other um, issues. But this is what kills me about academic science. That would be great in a, in a perfect world, but I, I don't live in that perfect world. I see 30 to 40 people a day and they all have a lot of problems. They all have a lot of pain. They're all dealing with about 50 different things. They've got family issues. They've got job issues. They're stressed to the max. They don't have time to go to the store. If they go to the store, they can't find anything but processed foods. I mean, the real world is very difficult. So I'm just trying to give you practical things that would really help you. It's not gonna be perfect. None of us are perfect unless you're in an ivory tower academic center. But I think that you can get a lot better. And this is one way to do it that's been proven. And guess what? It's delicious. So now there's going to be some people in the audience, I'm sure, that love the keto diet or love paleo or think low fat's the way to go. I like the Mediterranean diet because I think it makes the most sense from what I know about chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. And it's got a lot of history behind it. So it has been shown over and over again to prevent and treat these non-communicable diseases. Okay? Uh, if you adhere to a Mediterranean diet, you will have less diabetes, less heart disease, less obesity, less neuropathy, less arthritis, less Alzheimer's, I can go on and, and less cancer. Name it, you have less of it if you're on the Mediterranean diet. You know what you have more of? More fun, more fun with your grandkids, more muscle, more ability to exercise. You're happier because you're less depressed because you're having more omega-3s and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So the diet that you eat can reduce inflammation. 
you have to get away from the modern ultra processed high in omega-6 diet that is being shoved into you by the food industry. You have to make your own foods. You have to go to the Mediterranean diet or something like it that's filled with phytonutrients from vegetables and fruits. Let's go to the next one. So this is sort of the Mediterranean diet food pyramid, okay? So we want anti-inflammatory diet. This is an anti-inflammatory diet. You don't, you want to avoid ultra processed foods. So that's basically anything you find in the grocery store, honestly. 75 to 80% of American diet is ultra processed. This is the stuff that's been broken down into different components or molecules in one side of the factory and put together in another side and then put into a plastic bag in the other part of the factory. Those are the foods you want to avoid. So the, the rule of thumb is anything with more than five ingredients. Go to the grocery store and try to find something in a bag that has less than five ingredients. It's not a lot. Um, the process of processing increases the level of advanced glycation end products in most food products. They use emulsifiers and different chemicals and solvents during the course of making something shelf stable and able to be transported on trucks across the country. Um, and so ultra processed foods are very inflammatory. This is why I'm saying cook your own food. Get the whole ingredients and cook it yourself. That is what's called minimally processed, which is what you want. No processed or minimally processed. You don't want highly processed or ultra processed. <clears throat> so you want foods that are high in phytochemicals. These are the flavanols, the flavonoids, the phenols, the phenolics, all of the micronutrients, the terpenes, all of the different substances and plants that help induce good healing in your body and help turn off inflammation and turn off that NF-kappa alpha or kappa beta pathway we talked about. High in dietary fiber, this helps your gut biome. Whole grains, you have to have a certain dietary fiber to carb ratio, 10 or less. Uh, most processed foods have no dietary fiber and a ton of simple carbs, which is terrible for your gut biome. <clears throat> and then you want to eat lots of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, and then hopefully a lot of extra virgin olive oil, which is a monounsaturated, filled with oleic acid, which is extremely antioxidant. The omega-3s, I cannot express enough, are so good for you. Now, be careful with this because the Mediterranean diet per wants you to eat fish a few times a week. Problem with most fish today, when you go try to find it, it's very hard to find wild caught fish. So you're gonna be eating farm raised fish like tilapia or catfish or whatever. Well, guess what they feed that? The same thing they feed the feedlot cattle. They're throwing in grains and corn and those fish are not high in omega-3s. So I supplement with omega-3. I take about four grams a day now. Um, Talk to your physician about that, but there's more and more data showing that the long-lived healthy populations have a very high percent of omega-3 relative to the short-lived, poorly-lived populations. <clears throat> Omega-3s give you a flexible cell membrane, and they cause the inflammatory cascade to go into a healing resolving pathway versus a damaging inflammatory pathway. Omega-6s push you into the bad side. Omega-3s push you to the good side. Our American diet is filled with omega-6 and terribleness. The Mediterranean diet is much higher in omega-3s. But extra virgin olive oil is the key, I think. Um, and it has to be extra virgin olive oil. And it has to be in a dark bottle. You have to eat it within three months of buying it. And ideally, you'll find some that's high in polyphenolic or oleic acid content. Go on. But the Mediterranean diet, is your that is your magic bullet. That is how you can control all of this problem, or at least your best tool, okay? And there's actually a lot of studies out there now showing that although you think this might be expensive, this is actually a much cheaper way to eat than what we are doing now in America. And it prevents the very expensive trips to the hospital that are in your future if you keep eating the way most Americans eat. So substantially anti-inflammatory diet. And it includes fats. Fats are not bad for you. They just have to be good fats. So it modulates the gene expression in a beneficial way for you and you turn on more anti-inflammatory genes and fewer pro-inflammatory genes. It regulates the arachidonic acid production. We just talked about that. Uh, omega-6 will go to arachidonic acid and bad inflammation. Omega-3 goes to what are called resolvins and healing molecules. It even sounds better. Um, activates the immune system in a protective fashion. So it'll do the acute inflammation when necessary and then shut it down. If you're filled with omega-6s, it never shuts down. <laughs> and then cytokine reduction. There was a feeding study. So feeding study sounds so terrible, but that's when you literally feed people certain things and you don't let them eat other things or you try to. Um, and the best feeding studies are on inpatients so that they're totally controlled. Um, outpatient feeding studies are prone to a lot of error, obviously. 
but they did do a feeding study looking at the Mediterranean diet versus a low fat versus a regular diet. And they showed pain reduction for knee arthritis only in the Mediterranean diet. I try to get all my patients that have achy joints, stiffness, weakness, and arthritis to get on a Mediterranean diet because this is so good for your joints and your musculoskeletal tissue. We have a question. So what if you take omega turmeric supplement that includes other omegas other than just omega-3? The question is, what if you take an omega supplement that includes other omegas besides omega-3? I'm not sure what the goal is with that particular supplement um, because omega-6s, you get plenty of that from the American diet. Um, it's really hard not to get them. Um, I think that they, the term for the monounsaturated olive oil is omega-9. Uh, that If it's oleic acid, I think that's probably beneficial. But I wouldn't take extra omega-6s, although they are, you have to have them. They are important for human health, but we get plenty of them. So I think the problem with the American diet and probably most modern diets is the lack of good omega-3s, not the lack of omega-6s. So, I, you know, I'd have to see what, what the goal of that particular supplement is and um, what other omega and why is it in there. I don't know. I'm a big fan of omega-3s for a variety of reasons. So again, increased omega-6 and decreased D3 intake have been associated in arthritis with more subchondral bone loss. So when I get an MRI of somebody with knee pain, if the bone looks bruised or there's swelling or edema in the bone, the first thing I do is check their vitamin D level and almost all of them are deficient. Edema on MRI and bone is highly associated with low vitamin D3 status. So one way to treat your pain is increase your D3. Um, D3 is cholecalciferol. It's technically a hormone, although it's called a vitamin, but it has receptors everywhere, including receptors on osteoblasts or bone forming cells and osteoclasts, bone eating up cells. So D3 is hugely important. High levels of omega-6, remember, shoots you down that arachidonic acid, bad inflammatory pathway, which does what? Irritates the cartilage, the synovium, and the subchondral bone, and induces pain and inflammation and arthritis. So a lot of my patients with arthritis, after I check their D3 levels, I'll prescribe and put them on omega-3s if they can't afford supplements. Because that's the other problem in our country. Insurance companies aren't going to pay for you to take supplements or pay for you to eat the Mediterranean diet. But they'll sure pay for a total knee arthroplasty. Doesn't make much sense to me, but it is what it is. So if I have patients on a fixed income that can't afford supplements, and if I can get away with it and get it covered, I will put them on an omega-3 to help with arthritis for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> First of all, it decreases depression, which decreases pain, and it decreases inflammation that's, that's the source of a lot of the problem. They've done MRI studies of people with knee cartilage on a Mediterranean diet. And then in this study of 783 people in the Osteoarthritis Initiative, which is this huge registry ongoing long-term chronic uh, study in our country. Adjusting for all confounding factors or variables that you would think of, like do they smoke, are they obese, yada, yada. When they adjusted and statistically regulated for all of that, the people on the Mediterranean diet had better looking knees on MRI, more cartilage. And then a poor antioxidant intake. Remember I talked about the antioxidant balance when we were talking about brain health? Poor antioxidant intake is linked with osteoarthritis progression. Why? Because you're not controlling the reactive oxygen species, those little stray electrons that are attacking the cartilage, attacking the synovial lining, attacking the subchondral bone. You have to control it and neutralize it. You got to take antioxidants. Unless you're eating a full nine servings of fruits and vegetables daily, like you're supposed to on the Mediterranean diet. <clears throat> next slide. No, can't go to the next slide. Question. Yes? How much D3 Question is, how much D3 should I be taking? My level is 33. So according to the federal government, you're fine, right? But their levels were set before we knew half, I'd say before we knew 90% of what we know. I mean, we knew nothing when they set those levels about how important D3 is. They set those levels to prevent rickets and like super diseased bone, osteomalacia. So 30 is considered normal, the normal range by the federal government. I don't think that's normal. And a lot of the studies now for D3 show optimal for like 
people in middle age should be somewhere around 50, 60. If you're an athlete, it should be even higher, 70 to 80 to prevent stress fractures. So I think you keep taking D3. I personally take about 5,000 international units every day. Um, and mine has gone up steadily over the past couple of years. So I'm going to stay on that and hopefully it'll get to the optimal level where I want it to be. But I know all this stuff, but I didn't know it before. And it turns out I was D deficient a few years ago. I mean, it's amazing how much medicine um, has neglected nutrition and diet. So I, I'll be honest with you, I've taught myself all of this because they certainly didn't tell me any of this in medical school and definitely not when I was a resident. And even today, people in the orthopedic world will laugh at you if you start talking about this stuff. So um, I would say keep taking about four to 5,000 units a day. Of course, I have to put the caveat, please speak with your treating physician um, because I can't treat anybody this way. But 30, I think is not good enough for optimal health. Will you not get rickets? Sure. But will you be optimized? No, you should be closer to 50 to 60, even higher, honestly. Go on. Question is, can you make the Mediterranean diet work without fish? So interesting that you asked that because I was just thinking about that yesterday um, because I don't eat a ton of fish, mostly because I'm really terrible at cooking it. And every time I cook fish, it tastes terrible. Um, I have to like go to a friend's house where they actually know how to cook to do it. Um, and also most fish are farm raised. So, what do you, so, so eating fish in our society is not the same as when they historically studied people in the Mediterranean in the 50s and 60s that were catching it fresh from the non-polluted Mediterranean Sea at that time. Um, so I supplement. That's how I get my omega-3s. You can get them from walnuts. Um, potentially, you could get it from like flax and things like that or microalgae if you wanted to. Um, personally, I supplement. Um, so yes, you can do it without eating fish. All right. Diet and inflammation and OA. Okay. This is my this is where I'm going with all this. So I think arthritis can get better with just controlling your inflammation, just like heart disease can get better with controlling your inflammation, just like your brain can get better. If your brain and your heart and your blood vessels and your kidney and your diabetes can get better with diet, why can't your arthritis? Why is this so poo-pooed? I totally believe this. So the Osteoarthritis Initiative study looked at about 4,300 patients or so, and they actually looked at the adherence to a Mediterranean type diet in the presence of arthritis. And those that had the highest adherence to the Mediterranean diet, so the ones that cheated the, the fewest amount of times, had a 17% lower prevalence or even existence of knee arthritis. They had less morbidity, meaning if, even if they had arthritis, they had fewer symptoms. They also weighed less because when you eat this diet, you're naturally going to weigh less. And they had less diabetes. And they believe that it's related to the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties of the Mediterranean diet. You might think to yourself, well, duh. But, you know, we have to do all these prove what's common sense studies. Consistent consumption of the Mediterranean diet is associated with less pain, less disability, healthier aging, and reduction in these cartilage degrading markers. So there's ways to look at the amount of cartilage in your body that's breaking down. There's some biomarkers you can look at. A lot of it's really at just the research level right now. But if you stick to this sort of a diet, your cartilage will last longer and will be healthier. And then they did animal studies with just olive oil, okay, oleic acid, extra virgin olive oil. And they showed in that reduced cartilage deterioration, less swelling and less inflammation within the cell. Remember I told you the synovial lining gets packed with all these T cells, B cells, mast cells, natural killer cells. That happens less in a diet heavy with extra virgin olive oil. And then human studies with an extract of extra virgin olive oil also showed less pain, less inflammation, and a higher quality of life, which let's face it, that's all we really care about. Who cares about all this stuff? You just want to feel good, look good, and have fun, and play with your family, and you know, do good work, and perform. And that's what this is all about. I think if you could control your inflammation, which is this and sleep are your best tools, you're almost there. So what foods do you avoid? Basically, don't go to a grocery store. I'm being facetious, but I'm not being facetious. <clears throat> the grocery store is filled with the food industry's attack on you, okay? Filled with ultra processed foods. If you go to the grocery store, try to just buy the fruits, the vegetables, try to find whole grains. The good news is nowadays, because of the keto diet boom, there are a lot of bread-like products that have a better ratio of dietary fiber to carbs. At the end of the day, it's still ultra processed. 
I personally keep toying with making my own bread and trying to find the right way with the right ratios where it still tastes good. Um, I'm not a baker by trade, so this is a slow rolling project. Haven't made it there yet, but I'm working on it because I love bread. And whole grains have been shown to be helpful in the Mediterranean diet, but it just has to be right whole grains. Problem is you cannot find these. If you go buy bread, it is not good bread by and large. Oh, uh, what's the dietary fiber carb trick? I believe that I'm correct here. <clears throat> I think the ratio needs to be 10 to one. So if you have 10 carbs, you should have one dietary fiber. Ideally, the ratio would be lower. But you will see a lot of the stuff you buy is like 30 grams of carbs and two, two grams of dietary fiber. That's horrible. You don't want that. And then anytime you see something where it says enriched white flour, that basically means they took the wheat kernel broke it apart, took the center endospore, crushed that around, bleached it, processed it through this machine. And then at the end, they said, oh, maybe we should add back some of those vitamins we bleached out and took out with solvents. So they do that. That's the enriched white bleached flour. That's what most breads are made with. So think about how terrible that is. And it's done in high heat environments. So there's more advanced glycation end products attached to that as well. So avoid ultra processed foods. Basically, and look, we're all going to cheat every now and then, but try to avoid potato chips, French fries, uh, all of these box cereals. I stopped eating cold cereal a while ago because it's just so processed. Um, basically, five ingredients or less is ideal. That's almost impossible to find, but you get the point. Start somewhere. It doesn't have to be perfect. Processed animal proteins. So natural, grass-fed, grass-finished steak that you cook yourself with your own extra virgin olive oil in your own stove you know, making sure you're not dipping it in chemicals and stuff. That is going to be your best meat, okay? You want to avoid processed things like bacon, hot dogs, ham, bologna, lunch meats, all this stuff that's made in a factory. Just stay away from it. Refined sugar, we talked about that. Fructose, terrible, obviously. High fructose corn syrup, approved by the FDA and said generally recognized as safe until uh, very recently. Also terrible chemicals. Try to, a lot of people poo-poo organic. Um, I've got family members that think I'm crazy because I only buy organic and they think it's all fake and just marketing. It is regulated to a certain degree. And in my opinion, organic's better than not organic in general. Um, it's still always better to eat fruits and vegetables than to not eat it. So if you can't get organic, still get the fruits and vegetables. But in general, I try to avoid eating chemicals. Thus, I like organic. And then avoid 80% of what's sold at your grocery store. That's all I can tell you. That's how bad it is out there. Maybe you have a local farmer's market that you could go to, but then it's not going to be organic, likely, because those guys aren't regulated. Okay, so this is an inpatient study. So 20 adult inpatients, they were allowed to eat whatever they wanted for two weeks of this study. But one group was given ultra-processed food products. One group was given unprocessed food. Now, they were matched in general, the presented food, okay? was matched for calories, for sugars, for fats, for fibro, and for the amount of macronutrients. At the end of the study, basically people on the ultra processed arm ate about 500 calories more a day. What does this tell you? That ultra processed foods induce more eating. They actually make you want to eat more, okay? Because this was matched, like you could eat what you want and it was matched for calories, but the people on the unprocessed side for some reason just didn't eat as much because they didn't want to and they didn't need to and their body was working correctly. And then the body weight changes that happened, the ultra processed group obviously gained weight, was highly correlated with the diet differences. And again, this is like a, a course kind of a thing, but I mean, this is a study that was just recently done in 2019. It's like, at what point is medicine gonna catch up on this stuff? All right, so let's talk about FDA approvals, your overarching overlord of safety, correct? They have approved partially hydrogenated oil, terrible for you. Foods that include flame retardants, terrible for you. Oleane or Alestra, remember those fat-free chips that caused a whole bunch of GI problems? Terrible. Caramel and other colorings, cancer risk, okay? So when you see something that says caramel coloring, that is a risk for cancer. Uh, the GMO or the... Um, hormonally and genetically modified dairy products, FDA approved. High fructose corn syrup, FDA approved. Emulsifiers, damage the gut microbiome to a great degree in a lot of foods that you eat, also approved. 
monosodium glutamate and pink slime. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there's a big controversy about pink slime. This is essentially the meat sludge from those processed meat products that people eat. And then it's treated with chemicals and then it's put back into meat, particularly ground meat, um, to make it have the right texture and to be able to be moldable and not glup up together so that it has the appearance that people like. Also approved, also terrible for you. And then just remember that a third of the approved pharmaceutical prescription drugs have problems. I'm not making this up. This is from the Journal of the American Medical Association. And then 5% of drugs are pulled off the market annually. Food additives are pushed by lobbyists and are regulated by the people that, you know, the revolving door of the government, the regulators and the lobbyists. They're put on these foods to increase shelf life and they're engineered these foods to make you want more and more and more. There are hidden sugars in salty foods because that triggers a certain reaction in your gut and your body that makes you want to continually eat more of it. You never hit a natural satiety point or a natural <clears throat> point of being full. We saw that in that inpatient study. The people that ate natural unprocessed foods at some point just said, I don't, I don't need any more food. The people that eat processed foods never hit that point. And maybe this is by design. I don't know. I would have to think so. Uh, and then most of these things are only studied for their effects on the liver and the kidney. They don't look at the effect on the mitochondria. They don't care about the effect of the gut biome. They're not looking at the effect on insulin deployment and advanced glycation end products. So only you can look out for that and only you can check it out for yourself. So the key, I think, the easiest way to manage this all is a Mediterranean diet with whole foods that you cook yourself at home with extra virgin olive oil. And then you could control your inflammation and then work on getting good sleep. Look, I struggle with this. I think everybody struggles with this. Do everything you can to make your sleep system better um, because it is so important. Try to avoid stress. If your life is naturally stressful, try to do deep breathing, box breathing, try to take a transcendental meditation course, do something uh, to try to decrease your stress, massage, yoga, whatever you can do. Strongly encourage you to avoid ultra processed foods because they induce reactive oxygen species, chemical damage to your cells and inflammation, and also the advanced glycation end products. So Mediterranean diet, do it. It'll help you lose weight. It's natural, it's yummy, it's healthy, and it's completely approachable and doable and it's economical. And that'll help you avoid those metabolic syndrome features we talked about. Exercise, we didn't really get into it in this talk, but also very, very important. You wanna maintain muscle mass as you get older um, because that helps pull uh, sugar out of the bloodstream and it just, having muscle helps control a lot of metabolic processes that reduce inflammation over time. And then if you can't do everything perfectly or even if you are doing things perfectly, still I think some supplementation is good, I do it. Omega-3s in particular, D3 for sure, and a lot of the phytochemicals to increase your oxidant status because most of us on the balance should be here, but most of us are pro-oxidant and too low in the antioxidants. So you wanna, if you eat the Mediterranean diet, you'll drop your pro-oxidant, and if you get good sleep and control your stress, and then you wanna increase your antioxidant, and then you're right where you need to be. Balance, that's what we're all looking for, is balance and just having a good life and aging well. Okay. Oh boy, we have a lot of supplement questions. Oh, I'm gonna talk about a few supplements right now, but I'm sure you'll have other questions. Just quickly about some anti-aging treatments you may be hearing about. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy. This has been shown to increase telomere length, which is sort of the marker of how long a cell is gonna live by 20%. Problem is these people went 90 minutes a day for five days a week for three months. I mean. That I, if I had one in my office, I couldn't do that. So I think hyperbaric oxygen is probably going to have a, a role in the future, but right now it's a little bit too um, impractical, shall we say. Autoimmune drugs. Remember I told you about the TNF-alpha inhibitor and the IL-16 and all those big gun disease-modifying drugs that they give people rheumatoid and lupus? There may be a role for that in the future for things like arthritis and controlling the inflammation of excess energy status. Rapamycin, which is, um, I think it was a leukemia drug to begin with, that's been shown to extend life and help reduce um, markers or genetic changes that induce inflammation and whatnot. Metformin or berberine, if you can't get prescription metformin, also been shown to reduce glycemic levels and help control inflammation that way. Intermittent fasting, very, very good. 
very easy to, not easy to do, but totally within your control and zero cost. Um, cold and heat therapy also been shown to, sh to give you short-term stress to the body that induces all of that autophagy and mitophagy and cleanup process we talked about. There's a weird treatment parabiosis where some people will actually get a complete blood turn. They'll take blood from a younger person and replace their older blood with young blood. And that's actually been shown to help obviously somewhat impractical and probably not allowed in this country. And then nutraceuticals, which is what we're about to talk about. Resveratrol, often called the uh, longevity, um, I guess, phytochemical. Some people disagree with this, but I think that there's enough evidence with the Mediterranean diet, with grapes, things like that, and um, Japanese knotweed, that I think resveratrol definitely has a role. NMN, which is a precursor of NAD, which is nicotinamide, adenosine, diphosphate. It's an electron carrier, important energy production for the mitochondria. Tart cherry extract, which is anthocyanins. These are flavonoids that are antioxidant that will neutralize all those reactive oxygen species we talked about. Same thing with turmeric. There's a ton of phytochemicals out there that can reduce oxidative stress. And then omega-3 we talked about, which I think is really important. So let's, uh, I guess, get into that. The question is, can I take supplements that will help me to fill the gaps even if I'm trying a holistic diet? Yes, that's what I do. So I try to eat well, but with my schedule and my, you know, clinic and stuff, it's, it's hard to get nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day. I mean, that would be ideal, right? How awesome would that be? First of all, I don't have time to eat that. Second of all, I don't have time to prepare it. Third of all, it, I mean, it's just not happening for me. So I have to supplement. So yes, I do the best I can with my diet, but I definitely supplement. Now, if you can find whole organic foods that are close to their natural state, not farm raised, et cetera, et cetera, and eat a perfect diet, more power to you. That is the ideal situation. I just think that's almost impossible nowadays in modern society. So we're gonna talk about a few supplements now. So this one, CoQ10, tart cherry, and shaga, all of these are strongly anti-inflammatory. CoQ10 is one of the electron carriers that is in the electron transport chain that moves an electron from position to position as the body extracts energy out of food. And then it in, is in and of itself a strong antioxidant because it has, it has that ability to capture electrons. So very, very important, particularly if you're on a statin and you have muscle pain because the statins block the production of cholesterol. But on that pathway is your natural production of CoQ10. So your, your levels will drop. And a lot of people will get muscle pain or connective tissue pain when they're on these drugs for cholesterol. So CoQ10 is one way to combat that. <clears throat> tart cherry extract we talked about. I love tart cherry extract. I mean, I, I see no problem with taking tart cherry extract if you're allowed to eat cherries. So a lot of people get worried about it. Oh, it's going to interact with this and that. And oh, it, what about this medicine that I'm taking? Oh, I'm on dialysis or I have a million questions about it. At the end of the day, if your treating physician says you can eat 150 cherries, I don't know why you can't take tart cherry extract. The beauty of it is it doesn't have the sugar or the calories. So it's calorie free, sugar free. But it has all the antioxidants that are the phytochemicals that are needed. And then the same thing with shaga mushrooms. You don't have to sit and slam, you know, 100 mushrooms. You can just take a little extract and get a lot of the phytochemicals out of it. No, you're not getting any fiber. You're not getting some of the other terpenes. But it's still, I think, better than nothing. So that's why I like supplements. Um, inflammation and pain control. Delta-8 is really good. This is a deriv derivative of the, um, the cannabis plant, as is CBD. Both of these... Uh, work on what's called the endocannabinoid system, which is this ubiquitous, massive receptor system in your body that helps control and regulate other systems, in particular, the inflammatory system or the immune system. CBD is strongly associated with immune system regulation. So I'm a big fan of taking these natural phytochemicals that help your body self-regulate. Um, it's sort of like the background, I guess, I don't, I don't know, this, the code written in your software that makes sure everything shows up on the page the right way. Delta H, strongly associated with pain relief and improved sleep, and CBD, very, very good for the immune system. Again, you always have to check with your physician. Oh, okay. The question was, what supplement do I recommend to de-stress the system? So 
I guess that means to reduce the chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. So first of all, omega-3s, because you have to get the right ratio in your body of omega-3 to 6. Second of all, CBD will attach to the CB2 re receptors on the immune system. Third of all, the Delta-8 will attach to the CB1 receptors and some CB2 receptors and help to regulate the endocannabinoid system. The turmeric, the tart cherries, all of those uh, colorful fruit and vegetable derived like beta carotenes from carrots and sweet potatoes, all of those phytochemicals are strongly anti-inflammatory and can help mitigate um, stress and inflammatory states. Anton says hi. Hey, Anton. <laughs> I talked about mental stress. We had a question about mental stress. Mental stress, you may remember like years and years ago, people would say, oh, that guy had a heart attack because he's so type A. I don't know if you remember ever hearing that. Well, that was kind of a big deal for a minute, and then it got poo-pooed and pushed aside, and oh, it has nothing to do with that. Oh, his work stress is irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Turns out it's probably the only thing that really does matter, short of your diet. Um, so the guys that are stressed out and girls, super stressed out, always turned on, never turned off. Cortisol levels are always high. Inflammation is always running strong. Those are the people that have problems. So if you can control your brain and get into certain brain waves that induce a calming or a vagal response and increase your parasympathetic nervous system, which will then balance out your sympathetic nervous system, then you're doing yourself a world of favor. I've sort of taught myself how to do box breathing during the day to try to control my stress. There's other ways you can breathe. You can inhale, inhale again to make sure all of the lung cells are opened up with oxygen and then do a long, slow exhale. And that'll get rid of a lot of excessive carbon dioxide. Um, transcendental meditation is probably one of the best. Usually you need a coach or some sort of teaching moment to really learn how to do that. Um, but even just five minutes of deep breathing on your own just trying not to think about anything is probably very helpful. Controlling your mental stress is huge. And I, I think that probably we physicians don't talk about it enough to our patients. Does Delta 8 have THC in it? I've been taking CBD tincture every day and it doesn't help with my overall body pain. Question is, does Delta 8 have THC in is it? in it because this person has been taking CBD tincture every day and they find it's not helping with their overall body pain. Um, yes, Delta-8 is Delta-8 THC. It's just Delta-8 tetrahydrocannabidiol versus Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabidiol, which is marijuana. So it's a you know one molecule difference. Um, so technically it's not marijuana, but it, it is THC at the end of the day. But, but it's to legally be sold, which of course ours is legal, um, it has to be less than 0 0.3 delta 9 THC, which it is. But check with your physician on this, of course, and it will show up as THC on a test. But it does help with pain to a tremendous degree. But you have other tools. You don't just have to take that, remember. Diet is massively important, sleep, et cetera. And you know, maybe how much CBD you're taking. Maybe you're taking 25 and you need to bump it to 50 or 100. You know, low doses have been shown to help during that day. If you're going to take a lot, I would, you know, a higher dose, it probably should be taken at night because it does help with sleep. And you obviously don't want to be sleepy during the day. Delta 12. Somebody just sent in a comment saying that they, uh, spent a lifetime not being able to sleep and they just started taking Delta 12 and now they're sleeping all night. So there's Delta 8, there's Delta 10, there's probably a Delta 12, an 11, a 9. I mean, again, it's one molecule off. It has to do with what's called the carboxylation of the THCA from the actual plant. It goes through a heat, a, like a, either some type of extraction process and then it gets converted to these forms of THC that are biologically active. So that would make sense to me. Delta-8 does help people sleep. Oh, he corrected himself. I was imagining somebody probably did come up with a Delta-12 already. But Delta-8 does work well for sleep, for sure. But don't forget the other things. you got to sleep in a cool room. you got to keep it dark. You have to have a regular schedule. You can't 
Um, you know, another trick for people like me and probably you where your mind is racing all the time, if you just have a little notebook next to the bed, when you have that thought, just write it down and let it leave your mind. It, it's, it, it'll help your sleep tremendously. There's different little tricks you can do to try to keep the mental stress low when you're sleeping. What about PEA? How much to manage inflammation and pain? This question was, what about PEA? How much should I take to manage inflammation and pain? PEA for me is palmitoyl ethanolamide. There is a phenylalanine out there that's totally different, so don't get those two confused. Palmitoyl ethanolamide is in the same group of molecules that anandamide and 2-HG are in, which are in the endocannabinoid system. So PEA works on the same system, more or less, that CBD and THC do. Um, so there's really no unsafe level to date found in human studies. I think you can take up to 1,200 milligrams pretty easily. I, the diabetic dosing they use in Europe, because it's used often for diabetic neuropathy and things like that, I think is around 300 to 600 a day. Um, basically, it reduces inflammation of mast cells around peripheral nerve endings. Uh, I don't take PEA all the time. I kind of cycle it. Um, but it's about 300 to 600 a day is probably fine but you can take more. People with um, like failed back syndrome or arachnoiditis or these chronic inflammatory pain conditions where like they have a bunch of metal in their back and it's not going anywhere and a bunch of scar. Um, one, of the, one of the first tier treatments for that is high doses of PEA because it seems to help that pain a lot. Oh, one of, which product do you want me to talk about? Joint health or PEA? Oh, okay, I see. All right, sorry. We do have we have a single molecule PEA that we sell for people. You know, like if you think you're if you have like diabetic neuropathy or arachnoiditis or some sort of chronic radicular pain or arthritic pain, as we talked about, that you could take. But the Joint Health Multi has PEA in it as well, at a relatively lower dose, and it and it's combined with the turmeric and the ginger. And all of those have been studied for arthritic pain. Okay, it's in separate studies and sometimes together, and sometimes put head to head against the non-steroidals. And they all perform as well, if not better, with almost no side effects. Um, I will just put a caveat out there about the turmeric. If you are still one of these people on warfarin, although it's very uncommon nowadays, it it does seem to increase the activity of warfarin. So you have to be mindful of that. We have another question. Can I talk about an alternative to THC? It's kind of a vague question um, for sleep. Okay, so if you are in a job where you're going to get tested and you can't, or you're in a state where you can't get medical marijuana, um, you don't want to do Delta 8 because it shows up on a test. Uh, probably CBD, tart cherry, because it has melatonin, low-dose melatonin naturally found in the skins might help. There are some sleep gummies we have that have GABA in it, and GABA also decreases uh, levels of glutamate, which is the excitable neurotransmitter that tends to keep people awake. Uh, so I think one of the sleep gummies that has tart cherry, GABA, CBD would be an option, or there's one with melatonin instead of CBD. Um, but yeah, be, be careful with the Delta 8. It's powerful. It works great. But um, if you get tested at your job or you have a reason to not take something like that, I, I wouldn't take it. But the CBD is your next best option. Alpha lipoic acid uh, is another great antioxidant. So this is one, again, used in Europe almost as a medicine. It is lipophilic and hydrophilic. So it can uh, help with the oxidation that happens inside of lipid membranes in your cell and the oxidation that's happening in the cytosol or the fluid around the cell. Um, so it's a universal antioxidant and it's very, very good at reducing inflammation in the neural tissue. So people with diabetic neuropathy or rachnoiditis or these kind of painful like migraine brain conditions or that want to just reduce inflammation in the brain, alpha lipoic acid, PEA are great, as, as is a great diet, obviously, and good sleep which is, of course, the number one, and then the omega-3s. The nervous system multi has resveratrol. Chlorella, which is a green algae that detox, takes out heavy metals, has NAC and acetylcysteine, which is also good for the brain. It has uh, L-carnitine, also good for the brain. And then uh, the omega-3s, which I'm a huge fan of, obviously. We've talked about that. I could probably do a whole talk on omega-3s if you wanted. Um, it's, it's 
Another comment. Hold, please. Did you have a book or written information out? Yeah. So the question was, do I have a book or something out with this information uh, for people that aren't going to remember it? Uh, first of all, the talk is recorded and you can access it again and again. And in answer to your question, I'm working on a book. I do not have it yet. We, uh, but I've started and uh, the process is ongoing. And the big point I want to make to people is, you know, all of this stuff about adding years to the end of your life or having a longer health span or reduce incidence of cardiovascular mortality. All that's so esoteric and like nebulous to people, but the same things that are going to do that for you will also just make you feel better today. You'll be more flexible. You'll be stronger. You'll have joint, less joint pain and you won't have to have unnecessary surgeries or surgeries that don't have the outcomes that they're purported to have. And that's what my book's going to be about, how to naturally treat musculoskeletal conditions and why that same protocol will also extend your, your health span and make you live longer and more optimally. So that's what I want to do. That's why I'm learning all this, and I just share it with my patients as I go. I don't understand. Can you rephrase that question? Okay, I got you. The question was, is there a chart that would give recommendations based on each area, um, which I think means per condition, what should I be taking? Now, let me, yes, you can go to the website and we have sort of a, a, a simple one of those. Problem is, I can't tell anything about you, right? I don't know what you're doing, what diet you're on, do you smoke, do you not smoke, what, what are your biomarkers, what's your homocysteine level, what's your uric acid, what's your high sensitivity CRP? Uh, you know, there's a million variables, but in general, yes. If, for instance, for rheumatoid arthritis, there's been a lot of studies on omega 3s and D3, so they definitely help. Turmeric as well, ginger as well. Um, for heart disease, same thing, there's a lot of studies on omega-3s, of course, D3, et cetera, and anything that reduces cholesterol, or total, I should say total cholesterol to HDL ratio, because that's what really matters. And then the weight loss thing. So yeah, we, we do have a simple one, but we're working on making it a little bit more um, user-friendly, I guess. But we do have one on the Well Theory website. Somebody thanked me in advance. Well, thank you, Miss Catherine. Uh, I'm, I keep learning. And I'm going to share it with you guys because I'm just astounded how much money goes into medicine and pharmaceuticals and medical devices and how it's just not moving the needle on how we feel on a daily basis. And I just want to make it better. Oh, you're going to buy my book. Thank you, Lisa. I hope to finish it within the next six months. Unfortunately, I'm still treating patients every day too, or fortunately. Okay. All right, so we're doing a giveaway for the CoQ10 gummies and the PEA single supplement. Catherine and Lisa got the giveaway, so that'll get mailed to you uh, shortly. All right, well again, please remember our soldiers and happy Memorial Day, and thanks for joining us.